What exactly is the opposite of Goldilocks? Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. And you take a look at the equity trade right now in the S&P 500. It's trying to go green, not quite exactly getting there, down about a tenth of a percent at the moment. That's even though you have seen big tech uh, flip into positive territory. The Nasdaq 100 up about two tenths of a percent. So again, fighting back. You take a look at the bond market right now. Can't exactly say the same. Yields down about a basis point or so on that 10 year Treasury yield. We're above 4%, uh, but not by too much. Again, it feels like 4% has been like a magnet. Uh, I will say that over and over again. And let's take a look at Bitcoin because it is drifting lower, only down about 1% right now, Romaine. This is as we count down potentially to SEC approval on that spot Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that a little bit later here on this show. But as far as the broader market goes, that massive year-end rally in equities is still showing some strain here at the start of the new year. Max Kettner, the chief multi-asset strategist over at HSBC, told Bloomberg Television earlier he sees a reverse Goldilocks scenario out there because of the mismatch between some of the aggressive pricing for Fed rate hikes, rate cuts, I should say, and a resilient economy that would suggest higher for longer rates. Now, Kettner says that if the economic outlook doesn't change, then the rates outlook needs to be corrected, and that will leave investors with very few places to hide. Meanwhile, over at PIMCO, they're saying don't give up on bonds. Not surprising, of course, coming from the world's largest active fixed income manager. But it does make the case that while duration risks should still be contained, bonds could see equity-like returns in 2024. Among the strategies PIMCO favors, yield curve steepening and a fuller embrace of private markets, which it says will offer some of the best lending vintages since the global financial crisis. And as Katie was just mentioning, the countdown to decision day for the crypto faithful continues. Bitcoin modestly weaker on the day, even with bouts of strong volatility in between as U.S. regulators face that deadline to decide on that spot Bitcoin ETF application by Kathy Wood's ARK21 shares and potentially for potential competitors as well. Katie. Let's kick things off right now with Philip Colmar. He is global strategist over at MRB Partners joining us on set Great to see you. And let's start off with the markets, because right now it feels like very much we're in a bit of a holding pattern. We do have some risk events coming up. Uh, we have CPI to look forward to and then earnings season. Which do you think is going to be more important as we really get into the meat of 2024? Is it this corporate fundamental outlook or is this still a macro market? Yeah, I think it is a macro market in the sense that inflation is still going to be very important to the Fed <clears throat> as we come through in this window of disinflation. That being said, as you said, we look at we've had a heck of a rally coming into this year um, and the financial markets have really repriced for that so-called Goldilocks scenario, both on the bond market and on the equity market. Now, Goldilocks being that we're going to slow down into a subdued growth backdrop. Um, and allow the Fed to provide those rate cuts as inflation comes down. I don't think that's the right view. And, and so both of those fronts will be important. Stronger earnings will be important, but also the fact that as we go through the year, inflation not coming down as much as the market's anticipating, not justifying those rate, Fed rate cuts. And so what does that digestion look like? Okay, let's say inflation doesn't come down as uh, some of the most optimistic cases that are priced in right now. How does that shake out when you think about equities in relation to fixed income? What looks like an opportunity and where would you stay away from? Yeah, so I think, I think in that shakeout or that, that congestion period, I think what you want to do is you want to focus on some of the laggards of, the, of, uh, of this rally, so to speak. So within the cyclical and the defensive side. So the laggards being places like the financials, which have done well as of late, but, uh, but certainly the financials, aerospace and defense. We recently took a, a recommendation into energy as well to add to that cyclical exposure. On the defensive side, you want to pair it a bit there, um, have some, uh, uh, we, we like the healthcare exposure at this point versus the other staples and, and utilities, and partially because I think the downward adjustment in terms of bond yields has pretty lar largely run its course. I think as the year goes on, as we see that we're going from a, what the world thinks is a soft landing to a no landing scenario, inflation not coming down, bond yields have more upside than they do downside. And so then you want to be away from the growth stocks and away from some of those bond proxies in the defensive space. So what's the reconciliation, though, between, I guess, what at least on the economic front, appears to be a relatively stable economy and a market that seems to be pricing in five, six rate cuts, which would presume a weaker economy than where we are. 
Yeah, so that's the that's real disconnect. If you look at where the data is, and even the Fed has given some signal towards those rate cuts, I would argue that if you went back into the end of October, we had sucked up a lot of, of the slack, but we hadn't become restrictive. It wasn't going down into, a soft landing was already in yeah. place. And since then, you look even the data, the Fed's weekly economic index or the Red Book surveys, those kind of things, you're seeing a sequential improvement. So we're going from soft landing to no landing. I think people have kind of priced out that recession. They've solidified around soft landing. But soft landing is your Goldilocks, where you get enough below trend growth that inflation keeps drifting down justifies those five, six rate cuts that are now priced in. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that without that, it's going to be really hard. If you stay above trend growth, it's going to be hard to get that super core measure of inflation down. And as the year progresses, there's going to be a real reconciliation of that, I think. Well, but for top-down investors, yeah. and I'm speaking specifically in yeah. equities right now here, is there a case to be made for a cyclical trade or I guess a more of a macro trade rather than some of the bottom up uh, stock picking that seems to be the yeah I think now. I think the macro trade comes into yeah. a no landing scenario yeah. so so growth is going to be better earnings expectations will be better which broadens it out yeah. at the same time on a global basis this year is going to be characterized by the trade cycle already starting to ebb higher yeah. you've got a semiconductor cycle in the back of that that starts to open up really a lot of your cyclical exposure even beyond the US into yeah. euro area into emerging Asia ex China uh, those kind of things we're going to start to see them start to they have got earnings improvings and and the investor base will start to solidify this the around the the sustainability of those earnings trends as the trade cycle picks up so I do think that as yes as we go in towards that no landing scenario yeah. rather than anything more dire because I don't think it's on that side yeah. there's going to be some opportunities for that broadening of the rally uh, catch-up phase all right Philip great to catch up with you Philip Colmar global strategist over at MRB partners helping us kick off to the close here on this Tuesday afternoon some breaking news a few minutes ago that we're now getting to with BlackRock said to be planning to dismiss about 600 employees, about a third of its global workforce. The latest retrenchment that we've seen from some of the big uh, banks and financial institutions on Wall Street. Uh, Bloomberg Wall Street reporter Shanali Basik uh, on set with us right now to walk us through this. I guess given some of the announcements we've heard from some of the other big banks on Wall Street, this isn't a total surprise. 3%, a relatively small number here. But is this maybe a harbinger of more to come? Yeah, it certainly should be seen as that because we have one of the biggest asset managers in the world expected, by the way, in just this quarter alone, this previous quarter, to have brought in another $600 million in assets, uh, given the market's rise, so their assets rising, if you will, but repositioning now, knowing that the asset management posi uh, positioning is changing. And you see that from the memo to staff from Rob Capito and Larry Fink, that is BlackRock's president and CEO, saying that new technologies are poised to transform our industry and every other industry. So you have BlackRock trying to capitalize on this ETF boom right. while also trying to double down on private assets and recognizing that there's a fundamental change. Do you need more people for that, though? So they say that the headcount will probably be larger yeah. at the end of this year. So you're yeah. cutting about 600 jobs here in the current workforce. Remember, BlackRock last year had, in January, about 2.5% of their staff dismissed and then another 1% of cuts in June. So it wasn't the only set of cuts that they had made. Now, remember, BlackRock's assets, even if you expect them to come in for the end of last year at $9.7 trillion, is less than they had at their 2021 peak, mm. given what we've seen in the changes in the market. A lot of this is market appreciation, right? But they are below where they had been before, and you have seen that reflected in the stock price of BlackRock in more recent moments. Yeah, and of course, that, those asset levels, uh, to your point, a lot of that has to do with the market. We're seeing that uh, among other money managers as well. And with that in mind, situate this in the broader context. I mean, Romaine mentioned that at the banks, you've seen layoffs. You also have seen layoffs uh, at other money managers as well recently. Yeah, and, and one question to ask. The industry is consolidating. You have a lot of these asset managers that are looking around knowing that scale is going to be important to them. And they're doing so by buying other assets that will help them push into different areas. One question mark when it comes to BlackRock is yes, they've been a behemoth in passive investing, but what will they do about that private asset business that they have? They want to double their revenue over the next five years. What kind of talent do you need for that? That tends to be very expensive talent. On the other hand, how much are they going to be investing in technology and new product areas? Katie, you've covered this religiously, uh, their movement into the Bitcoin ETF world, for example. And purely, when they think about the dollars that they're spending to maintain profitability in this new era of asset management, uh, how much of that investment goes to more people, more bodies, versus more technology to make them competitive? And how much of it goes around the world? 
to different growth regions yeah. where they could see more flows. All right, Shanali Basic, our Wall Street uh, beat a reporter here. A uh, closer look uh, at the latest news crossing the wire. BlackRock cutting about 3% of its workforce. That amounts to about 600 employees. And we should point out that memo uh, that Larry Fink uh, was a part of saying that the still, the company, will actually have a larger workforce by the time it gets to the end of the year than where it was last year. All right, a lot more coming up here on the show, including, well, an anniversary of what was dubbed the iPod phone. Of course, the iPhone unveiled back in 2007 by Steve Jobs. We're going to go out to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas to see, well, is there a next big device out there from anyone anytime soon? Plus, with New Year's resolutions underway, we'll look at the health of the fitness industry with Dave Long, the CEO of Orange Theory. And a focus on our supply chain, including tensions in the Red Sea and how it's affecting uh, all those ships trying to make their way to the U.S. A conversation with Mario Cordero, the CEO over at the port of Long Beach out in California. That conversation and so much more coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Some prices have not come down, and we're fighting pretty hard to get those prices to come down. One area that really is difficult for Americans is health care affordability. And that was Lael Brainer, Joe Biden's top economic advisor and, of course, the former Fed vice chair, uh, speaking on the latest episode of the Bloomberg Odd Lots podcast about the persistent price pressures facing Americans. Pleased to say that the co-host of Odd Lots, Joe Weisenthal, joining us right now to talk a little bit more about what we heard from her. And I think it was an interesting narrative here, Joe, because we've talked so much on the show about the disconnect between what some of the economic data yeah. shows, which is inflation now under control, or at least like it's on its way to yeah. getting under control, and all this anecdotal evidence from real people yeah. who say they're still upset about high prices. Yeah, I mean, yeah. most economists think that, you know, the labor market recovery has been unexpectedly strong. And the fact that the labor market has stayed so strong, even as, you know, measures of CPI have decelerated so much, like, this is pretty extraordinary stuff. And yet, obviously, we know there's widespread frustration with the economy still, which matters a lot to the White House, I think, in an election year. And so, as such, you know, you see, like, areas where the White House can theoretically target prices in a way that would be highly salient. So she talked about cracking down further on junk fees, which may not be a big contributor to measured costs of inflation, but might be the type of thing where, oh, people would really like cool. it if uh, the price of a hotel was actually the price that they thought they were getting or a but rental is that, car. But is that something yeah. immediate? I mean, as we know, a lot of people sort of, they just look in the here and now. I mean, they can say we're going to do this, we're yeah. going to build a factory to onshore this, but the effects of that won't be seen for years. I mean, well, you know, so, I mean, like, yeah. onshoring some sort of domestic production is exactly the type of thing that no one is going to notice anytime soon, yeah. which is its own issue for the administration, of course, because, of course, there are all these industrial policies that have been, you know, passed and theoretically big accomplishments. There isn't a lot tangible yet that anyone can point to. Yeah. But in the meantime, if the White House can use regulatory power, continue to push on legislation related to things like prescription drug prices, the bully pulpit of just sort of, you know, uh, you know, attacking corporate greed or prices being too high, then maybe at the margin there are opportunities to sort of, uh, you know, highlight to the public that prices can still come down. And I thought that was interesting because, I don't know, when we think about this being an election year, uh, people feeling still pretty miserable about inflation, it kind of feels, or you can say that you have Joe Biden at the mercy yeah. of the Fed to bring inflation down. And I thought this was interesting, that focus on junk fees in particular, yeah. a way that the administration could actually at least try to fight back. Right, again, like the, I don't think like junk fees are a huge contributor to measured inflation, but like, Again, if it were just about measured inflation, then you would expect to see sentiment much better because it really has. I mean, we were at over 9% on headline yeah. CPI in the middle of 2022, and over the last six months, uh, measures have been you know close to the Fed's target. So the question is, are there certain like high salience things, prices, things that really annoy people yeah. um, that oh, theoretically? I, I have a long list of things you that annoy have, people. I, <laughs> that should be. Do you have a monologue? Or I mean, things I, I that do. annoy how, me. How many, today. how many times did she use the the phrase Bidenomics on your program, if at all? Did she use it? I yeah. I can't remember. Because I don't. I don't know who. I think she did. Did she? I think so. Okay. I mean, one of the things that was very interesting yeah. in talking to her, you know, she put out this memo in December talking about, like, what drivers of uh, disinflation, and she pointed about supply-side inflation. And she was very, you know, clear, like, 
this is to Biden's credit. That is the work that the White House put into easing supply chain pressures of various sorts that have allowed this sort of disinflation to happen and allow inflation to come down without a major labor market weakness. Hmm. All right, Joe, great episode. Great to see you in person. Great to see you, too. Uh, that is Bloomberg's Joe Weisenthal, and you can always check him out on Odd Lots anywhere you find your podcast. Coming up on the close, though, we're going to take a look at the health of the fitness industry. More on demand at the start of the new year with Dave Long, the CEO of Orange Theory. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, we're in the second week of the new year, and not to put too much pressure on you, but how exactly is your fitness resolution going? One company that's hoping to attract more customers who want to get in shape and live healthier lives is Orange Theory. It's the gym that fuses digital technology with physical fitness. Pleased to say that the CEO of that company is joining us right now, Dave Long. Talk a little bit more here about the trajectory of the business and, of course, what I would presume is a relatively busy time for you as, of course, we all sort of want to start off the new year on the right foot here. So let's start there here. Uh, how much uh, increase in business do you see around this time of year? Hey, great to be on. Yeah, I mean, obviously, January every year comes around and people have fantastic intentions to uh, make a change to, to uh, their fitness regimen. So January is a very, a very busy year for us, you know, and we've come out of the gate probably stronger than ever uh, since back in 2019. Um, you know, having incredible increases in our membership um, now the first, you know, eight days of the year. We expect to have probably 20 percent of our growth, if not more, uh, in the month of January in 2024. I am curious about, I mean, we introduced you as the CEO. You're also the co-founder of this company, taking it from one location to something like 1,500 uh, across the world here. When we talk about the growth and the business model that you've built here, uh, how much further can that be scaled up from where it is right now? You know, we, we, we've pioneered really connected fitness and this personalized fitness back in 2010, and really the sky's the limit of where it can go. You know, we have over 1,300 locations in the U.S., but many, many hundred more to go. We'll, we'll open about 60 in the U.S. alone this year. But then when you look international, that's really decades of growth ahead for us. We'll open about 35 locations, um, 35 to 40 uh, internationally. Some key markets are going to grow substantially, Latin America, um, the GCC and uh, Japan's going to open additional units as well as Europe. So we're, we're really we're spread across the whole globe. And I think what's most exciting is no matter where we open and grow internationally, there's been a massive affinity for the product that Orange Theory has, which gets us very excited for the future. And Dave, let's talk about the competitive landscape here, because in addition to Orange Theory, I mean, it just feels like there's so many uh, different fitness options out there. If you think about CrossFit, for example, of course, Peloton, to some extent, uh, you can use the app at home for strength training and then just the normal gym, a normal uh, gym subscription, for example. How do you think about that, especially at January, the start of the year when a lot of people are going back to the gym? You know, I think the, the way that we look at it is very few Americans or even globally are getting the minimal amount of physical exercise. So it's really not a shortage of consumers. It's really lining up consumers with uh, a product that's going to get them results. So our, our focus has always been a very personalized experience where our customers can get results and they can see the progression very early on. For somebody to stick with the fitness routine, as we, we always talk about every year, you know, come February or March, a lot of people, they kind of fall out of the routine. Our goal and our mission is to really provide a, a routine and support so that folks kind of break through that one, two, three month period. We know when they they do that, they, they're committed for longer than three months. They typically stick with the routine for a year or longer. And so that's that's really been our focus. But there's a lot. There, it's a battle that I think all fitness companies are, are going at together is what we need to get people moving more and more active on a consistent basis. And if you think about some of the big themes of 2023, obviously weight loss drugs uh, are close to the top of the list there, Dave. And we ask retailers all the time, for example, about the Ozempic effect. But let's bring it to your business. I mean, is, the, is that a risk in your eyes, the fact that these weight loss drugs are very popular and only expected to get more popular? We really don't see it as a risk because regardless of taking something extra or, or using a, a drug like that to kind of accelerate weight loss, there still needs to be uh, the right physical activity, obviously the right nutrition, and it's really a, a 
to lifestyle, right? To, to, to you know, gain and maintain the, the results that you want, um, you need the well-rounded program. So we really provide the cornerstone of that. We know that different drugs and different things are going to come and go, but still the right fitness uh, regimen has to be part of it. Is there uh, a sense when we talk about just uh, the longer term trajectory of this business and just fitness trends in general, we know just how fickle they can be. I mean, what's hot today, you know, five years from now, you know, most customers will want something a little bit different. So how do you sort of, I guess, keep adapting uh, Orange Theory so that whatever that trend that people want a few years from now, you will we'll be able to accommodate them without a huge shift in business model or your finances? Yeah, it, it's a great question. So, you know, a couple of things is that the earlier generations, we called Generation W, the wellness generation. So Gen Z millennials, they're spending more on wellness. So as we look into the future, we know that there's a customer base that values what we're doing. We've had the, the Orange 60 total body workout from inception that is science backed technology track led by coaching. That's still the cornerstone and the best way to spend an hour if we want an amazing workout. With, with the rise in you know, understanding of how important strength is and other modalities, in the last six months, we have added two new products for the first time in the history of the brand. One being Strength 50. It's a 50-minute class devoted all to strength training, uh, very results-based. And then the one we just launched uh, in January is called Tread 50, and it's a cardiovascular base focus class. So now you have three products and your, your customers come in for different reasons or have, you know, different goals over time. Now they're customizing their routine based on three products versus one that we've had historically. We believe that that future proofs us for many years. And then on the way that we track goals and that we track progress for our members, the events that we, we do throughout the years, those are ever changing. Every year we come up with, with a, a brand new strategy of how to engage members throughout the course of the year, because again, it's all about their long-term routine. All right, uh, Dave, I really appreciate you taking time for us. That's Dave Long. He's the CEO and co-founder of Orange Theory Fitness, of course, this time of year. Most people really trying to get back in shape here. And Dave and, of course, uh, his team over there looking more at the longer term trajectory of his business. We do want to pivot to that, to some breaking news surrounding the controversy around the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Remember, there was controversy over the weekend after it was learned that he had been hospitalized on January 1st without informing the White House or top Pentagon officials. We have now learned that Lloyd Austin actually underwent a prostate cancer procedure back in late December. He was released, went home, and then was re-hospitalized at some point on January 1st. Again, his condition apparently did revolve around prostate cancer, but the real issue here is whether he should have informed the president as well as the top brass at the Pentagon once he knew that he was taking that leave. A lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg. Stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. This is the countdown to the close, just about 2.30 here in New York. The mixed day for stocks, a little bit of an update for bonds. Let's check in right now. What's going on in the commodity space? Abigail Doolittle standing by right now with our commodities close. Well, we have a pretty robust rally for commodities on the day, Romain. The Bloomberg Commodity Index up more than 1%, even with the Bloomberg Dollar Index higher. Typically, that wouldn't happen with commodities being denominated in dollars. But take a look at the strength that we have in particular for the energy complex. Crude oil really rebounding from yesterday's greater than 4% decline, the worst day since November. It's not really clear what's behind this, maybe some technical factors. We have natural gas higher on some of the storms that are uh, affecting the U.S. here and the expectation of cooler weather and uh, heating oil also higher than that. And then gasoline just going along for the ride up 3.5 percent. All right. Our thanks there to Abigail. Do a little look at what's going on in the commodity space as we turn our attention right now to supply chains. A lot of talk right now about some of the bottlenecks in the Red Sea, bottlenecks in the Panama Canal, and some of the rerouting that we've seen from a lot of the global shipping companies. Uh, the decision that uh, most top container liners have now rerouted vessels around Africa, resulting in a significant increase in fuel and insurance costs as well as transit times, and that's causing a rise in container rates. Now, we should point out we're nowhere near some of the extremes we saw at the height of the pandemic, but still something for concern. To get an update here on the health uh, of our supply chains, at least from the U.S. perspective, let's go out to California, where the CEO of the Port of Long Beach, Mario Cordero, is joining us right now. Mario, great to see you here in the new year. Thank you, Romain. Um, before we get to some of the more current stuff going on with the Red Sea and the Panama Canal, et cetera, I do just want to ask you about that sort of normalization of uh, shipping uh, coming out of the pandemic, which really distorted the volume of ships coming in and out of the U.S., and how close to sort of pre-pandemic normalcy did we get uh, towards the end of 2023? 
Well, as you stated, Romaine, we are in normalization, and we're at the point of where we were in 2019, which was pre-pandemic. So I can represent to you that, in fact, given the numbers that we project here at the end of year, we're exactly at that number of 2019. And as a matter of fact, I think for the Port of Long Beach, we're going to be 5% above the 2019 TEU number. So all is good in the West Coast, and particularly here at the Port of Long Beach. Uh, when we've spoken before in the past, particularly in the height of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, at least some ships that had the capacity to be rerouted to other ports, smaller ports, if you will. And the idea that maybe this could prove to be a long-term loss in certain types of business. I'm wondering if you got that business back. I think it's fair to say that uh, that projection of long-term loss has not come about. As a matter of fact, for the Port of Long Beach, if you look to a fourth quarter, uh, 2023, we were really robust here. And by that, I mean our 2023 20, uh, December TU number was 37% above the December 22, uh, 2022 number. So again, uh, all is good. Uh, and fortunately, uh, that dire prediction by some early in 2023 did not come about. So I think we're on a good pace now again. We're in a normalized state of mind and, and of course, and in, in also in operations. So uh, the West Coast is, is all good on the Western Front. So all good on the West Coast. Let's talk about what's going on in the Red Sea and, of course, what that means for shippers. Have you seen any impacts when it comes to the port of Long Beach, any ripple effects from this situation going on in the Red Sea? Well, first of all, I think what we have seen is the carriers are opting for the option to go uh, to the Cape of Good Hope uh, and come up the west coast of Africa to the uh, Europe destination. However, I think in time, if this continues, that is in terms of what we're seeing in the Red Sea, you are gonna see some numbers here increasing here at the Port of Long Beach and the west coast. So that's a, definitely an option for shippers, but I think for the short term right now, we haven't really seen that significant number, unlike the Panama Canal dynamic. Mm. Yeah, well, let's talk about that a little bit more, because in addition, of course, to the tensions uh, overseas in the Red Sea, like you mentioned, you think about the Panama Canal, those uh, drought conditions and the water levels. What's the impact from that? Well, obviously, for the Panama perspective, it's a negative impact. For the Southern California ports here, particularly Port, port of Long Beach, uh, we're going to we are seeing some numbers uh, from Panama, that is numbers, carriers that would have gone through the uh, canal uh, and now are opting out to come to the west coast here at Port of Long Beach and move the containerized cargo by rail to the Midwest and the east. So where we're at with Panama is, as you may know, on the average, 40 plus carriers go through the Panama Canal in normal times. That number has essentially been cut in half. So the Panama dynamic is going to continue for quite some time because of the drought conditions that they've experienced. I am curious if you worry longer term about, you know, the effects of climate change and whether that really could upend uh, shipping routes or I guess the alternative would be somebody, whether it's Panama or another country, is going to have to spend a gazillion dollars to try to come up with a different solution. Well, number one, I, I don't foresee another country uh, investing that kind of money at this point. I, I may be wrong, I know, but uh, I, for me, I don't see that. Now, I do see the Panama Canal dynamic continuing. Uh, the climate change agenda is going to be important for all shipping corridors and the global supply chain. It is for that reason that the Port of Long Beach has placed a lot of emphasis with regard to environmental sustainable development and addressing some climate change, cl climate change related projects, such as our Pier W uh, project that we have proposed. All right, Mario, it's great to catch up with you. Timely conversation. That is Mario Cordero. He is the CEO of the Port of Long Beach. Now still ahead, the 2024 CES conference is currently underway in Las Vegas, bringing together the biggest and best in tech, entertainment, and more. We'll speak to Dan Ives of Wedbush about what he's seeing next. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
All right, let's get right to our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Netflix, a cut to neutral over at City for what the analyst says are lofty financial estimates. Analyst Jason Bazinet also flagging a number of risks, including what he sees as high sales expectations, lagging investments in Netflix's content portfolio, and possible M&A activity. Netflix shares which rallied more than 2% yesterday, giving back four-tenths of a percent today. CrowdStrike up next. A raise to overweight over at Morgan Stanley. The price target also getting a boost to 304 bucks from 203. The threat of cyber attacks growing. That's what the analyst says. And the use of generative AI is becoming more fluid in a way that should benefit CrowdStrike. The shares having a pretty good day, up 5% here on the day. And finally, BMO Capital Markets starting coverage of tech and e-commerce stocks. That includes Alphabet, which was rated outperform, with the analyst saying that's the best positioned company to benefit from the implementation of generative AI and large language models into its platform. Not just here in the U.S., but international markets as well. Alphabet, which has been holding its own for quite some time, up about a percent and a half on the day. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to stay in the world of tech right now because most of those folks are converging out in Las Vegas at the annual CES conference. We've already heard some big announcements in the past from tech's biggest players, and we're on the lookout for more. Joining us right now to discuss so far is Dan Ives, who is out there in Vegas right now. He's senior equity analyst over at Wedbush. All right, Dan, let's get right to it here. I mean, normally these uh, CES events, at least uh, in the years past, usually were big affairs where you would suddenly get some big grand sweeping announcement about some new product. Is that still the case right now? Look, I think this is probably the biggest CES conference in 25 years. Because AI, the revolution's hit. It's going mainstream across enterprise and consumer tech. That's where the buzz is. We're not talking robots and drones. And, and you're really starting to see now use cases explode. That's what investors are focused on. What we believe fuels this new tech bull market. So give us a sense here as to how that works, because when we talk about, say, introducing hardware, I mean, obviously that's something everybody can see and feel, and it's a little bit more tangible to uh, the unwashed masses. But for something like AI, which is sort of baked into other products, how does that get showcased? It's really software and chips that are front and center. I mean, they're, they're the stars of this show, not hardware. Because what's happening now is that NVIDIA, the godfather of AI, Jensen, as well as Microsoft, they've laid the groundwork. But now it's about the use cases on the consumer side, on enterprise, marketing, healthcare, financials. I mean, this is, this is really unlike anything that I've seen in terms of just the monetization opportunities that are front and center. That's the difference with this CES versus previous ones. Okay, so Dan, you're in Las Vegas, you're at CES, and uh, I want to switch gears here because we have to talk about Apple because what a first week of 2024. Apple had two downgrades, and those are pretty rare to see at Apple. And if you uh, basically distill those two downgrades together, a lot of that is centered on the iPhone, about demand coming out of China. I know that you are a big Apple bull. How would you push back on what we saw last week? I'd say it's like watching Groundhog Day, the movie, <laughs> from a year ago, right? Because, look, I just focus on, if I'm not seeing cuts in the supply chain from our Asia checks, I believe it was a holiday quarter that was pretty much in line to actually slightly above for Apple. But it's all about the install base opportunity. $250 million are an upgrade opportunity. They still are holding their own in terms of China. And, and I think this is really, this is the get out the popcorn moment to when they're not just on Vision Pro, but the AI app store that we see them introducing over the next year. I think a year from now, this is a $4 trillion mark cap, but the haters are going to hate an app like they always will. All right. Well, the haters are hating. And uh, I see in your notes that Apple, it's still your top tech pick. Who's number two? Uh, it's that company in Redmond. I think Nadella, what Microsoft's doing, Apple and Microsoft, that, that's sort of the one two punch to our bull thesis along with broader software, you know, despite maybe a shaky start to the year, I think there's going to be a really good earnings season. I, I do want to go back to, uh, to Apple for one second, Dan. We'd be remiss in not pointing out that today is actually the anniversary of when uh, Steve Jobs uh, walked across that stage back in uh, Macworld, I should say, uh, back in 07 here and uh, unveiled that iPod phone, of course, which we know now has basically become probably one of the most dominant community. Uh, computing devices uh, ever uh, built here. And I'm wondering if maybe you could just kind of reflect 
on where Apple goes next. I mean, that was a monumental pivot for the company. And we should point out, they made a lot of announcements that day. It was not only the iPhone, but they introduced Apple TV. They changed their name to Apple Inc. They had huge software rollouts that basically became the core foundation of a lot of the services revenue that they have today here. And everybody still looks at Tim Cook and they say, what's next? What can you do to even one up that? Yeah, and I think, Roman, if you look on the Mount Rushmore of CEOs, historical champion, you're going to have Cook and Jobs. And now you have an install base of over 2 billion iOS devices, 1.2 iPhones. The monetization on services, that's what it's going to be about. You talk about AI, the opportunities. I mean, this is $100 billion annually of revenue. I think it's worth $1.5, $1.6 trillion. That's why I think many continue to say, where's the innovation in Apple while they're sitting there with an iPhone, iPad, and AirPods? And I think this is really the start of a renaissance of growth in Cupertino, despite many, you know, the bears all coming out of hibernation mode to start the year. All right, and we'll certainly uh, find out when we get a little bit more of his uh, Tim Cook's vision uh, when we get their earnings uh, in about three weeks' time. Dan, great to catch up with you. Dan Ives, Thank you. Uh, analyst over at Woodbush out in Las Vegas for the annual CES conference. Coming up here uh, after the break here, Maya McGinnis, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget President, going to be stopping by the program to discuss how policies from Biden and Trump might impact the economy. That conversation coming up next here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us as he does every day at this time. And David, a lot of people now turning their attention back to Washington, where I'm told we have yet another budget deadline ahead of us here. And I'm not really clear if we're going to get this done. Yeah, exactly. I don't think any of us are very clear about yeah. it. But we thought we would focus really on debt and deficit. And what's going on right now, what's going on with that deal that Romain just talked about, but also more broadly as we come into an election, what difference that might make to the economy, and particularly debt and deficit. For that, we turn to a true expert in the area. It's Maya McGinnis, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget President. So, Maya, thanks very much for joining us. Before we turn to what the candidates are proposing, let's talk about that tentative $1.6 trillion deal that they say is a spending limit. Is that going to, if it goes through, because we've got some steps to take, is that going to help us on the debt and the deficit? You know, it is. And I'm not used to delivering good news when it comes to fiscal policy. But this is part of the Fiscal Responsibility Act that, you'll remember, a few months back was passed in order to avert defaulting and allowed us to lift the debt ceiling. I will say that that deal was uh, terrible in that fact that we were talking about even defaulting should never be a discussion. But on the fiscal front, they actually made real progress by putting in some spending caps. Then we had a number of bumps in the road because the spending caps had what were called side deals. They were very tricky. Nobody understood the details. This is further clarification of how those side deals will work. And it will, in fact, lead to significant savings of a trillion dollars or more, which is much, much more than we've seen in, in even a decade. So this is an important first step forward in terms of moving in the direction of improving our debt and deficit instead of making it worse. But I will say it only focused on the domestic discretionary portion of the budget. That's the least problematic area of the budget. We're really going to have to look at the bigger issues of mandatory spending, health care, retirement, and taxes. Yeah, well, let's talk about some of those mandatory areas, such as Social Security and Medicare. And let's talk about the election coming up. We are getting some economic policy proposals now out of the candidates. And let's focus for the moment, at least, on the current president, Joe Biden, and the past president, maybe future president, Donald Trump. And you, as you look at their proposals, would they help us at all on the larger issues with respect to the budget? So far, neither of those candidates has put out anything close to a plan overall that would do anything to improve deficits and debt. And because both of them, uh, one is a former president, one is a current president, have fiscal records, we can also look at what they've done while they've been in office. And both of those presidents, even if you take the uh, terrible period of COVID when we had to borrow, and it was the right thing to do to borrow, but both uh, President Trump and President Biden in fact, made the fiscal situation worse during their presidencies in the periods of economic strength, meaning that rather than paying for all of their policies, they borrowed for a number of their policies. However, President Trump 
uh, borrowed significantly more, many trillions more in dollars than President Biden has. And more recently, President Biden has actually overseen steps in the right direction, including both the Inflation Reduction Act, which was trying to generate savings, not clear if it will, and then more recently, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, this bipartisan change. So that has been an improvement. But when it looks to the campaign promises they are making, both of them are actually focusing far more on the things they will not do. Most importantly, as you mentioned, neither of them has a plan to fix Social Security. And in fact, both of them have made, prom have made promises in the past not to touch Social Security, not to fix Social Security. What that means is beneficiaries will pay, face a 23% across the board benefit cut if we do nothing. So not only is that not improving the fiscal situation, that's leaving those who depend on Social Security at risk. We know the campaign season is not a good one for people being realistic about hard choices, yeah. but we haven't heard many hard choices out of either of them so far. Well, on that Social Security front, and we can really have the same conversation about all the entitlement programs, is how do you actually address that? I mean, it's one thing to sort of look at it from an intellectual and academic exercise and say, okay, here's what we need to do to change to get this under control. Most of those suggestions, I would think, would be completely politically unpalatable to most people out there, particularly anyone at or near retirement age. Yeah, the unfortunate reality is that fiscal responsibility is usually not politically palatable. And that's become more true in the recent years and decade because everybody kind of competes to be uh, more about giveaways. Here are tax cuts, here are spending increases. We won't pay for any of them. That's become the political norm. And the political competition is on basically who can give away more. The problem is that's led us to years and years of borrowing too much. We now have a debt that's about to be at record levels. Yeah. Interest payments that are the fastest growing part of the budget, about to be larger than defense. Social Security and Medicare both headed towards insolvency, and we're going to have to make some of those hard choices. When it comes to something like Social Security, easy for me to say because I'm not in politics, but we have to do a little bit of everything. We're going to need to slow the growth of benefits for people on the higher end of the income scale, lift the payroll tax cap so people pay more, raise the retirement age for younger workers. All of those policies are going to need to be part of a realistic solution so that benefits are available yeah. as promised well, and to those who need the most. Well, but I mean, I'm sure you saw some of the incidents uh, involving Nikki Haley, who basically made it clear that she did actually favor a raising the retirement age. And I think some other candidates also did, to be fair to her. But even she's been forced to kind of walk that back or at least to try to tamp it down a little bit because, look, you propose something like that and all of a sudden you have a lot of voters that look at you like you're the worst person in the world. Yeah, part of this we're actually going to have to look at ourselves as the voters, which is that if we don't want uh, debt at, at the record levels, higher than it's even been right after World War II, we're going to have to actually start asking our candidates and our politicians to make those hard choices. And so when you have a Nikki Haley or a Chris Christie who's out there talking much more realistically about the kinds of proposals that we need to be looking at. And there are many options, but they're talking about the need to do it. We can either uh, choose to reward people who are willing to level with us and tell us the truth, or we continue to ask for all sorts of free lunch situations and our debt will get worse. Our economy will be weaker for it. And more recently, it's become so clear that our high levels of debt are not just an economic threat, they're a geopolitical threat. They are a risk to national security. And so the more we ask our politicians to give us things in a reckless way instead of a responsible way, the more we jeopardize our economy, our national security, and our future. So in many ways, you're right, it is up to us. Are we going to say, you know, thanks for telling the truth about the kinds of fixes we need to deal? Or are we going to ask for more fairy tale solutions, which just won't work? Maya, it's always great to have you with us. Thank you so much for your time. It's Maya McGinnis. She's president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. I, as I listen to all this, yeah. I think of managing your own budget, and typically you both got to cut costs and raise revenues. Yes. We tend to say, let's just grow our way out of it, and yeah. thus far we haven't done so well. We haven't, and I just wonder, again, how you navigate the policy. The Nikki Haley thing really struck me, particularly yeah. in that interview she gave on Fox, where she tried to walk back previous comments she made actually right here on Bloomberg with Joe Matthew. And look, I mean, what she said was, I think, what any academic, any economist would say is probably what we need to do. But as I'm sure you know, David, no voter wants to hear that. No voter that, of course, is going to be dependent on Social Security. Yeah, what did Pogo say? We've met the enemy and he is us. Yes. Basically, yeah. us voters don't like to yeah. be told we're going to have less of anything. Yeah. We're going to have more, yeah, which isn't good for the debt yeah. and the deficit. Tomorrow, we're going to talk with Israeli venture capitalist John Medved of our crowd about the effects of the continuing war in Gaza on the Israeli economy. And on Friday's Wall Street Week, we'll welcome back Steve Ratner of Willard Advisors for his investment outlook for 2024. That's 6 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. And you can catch
catch David Weston every day around this time right here on the close for our Wall Street Week daily segment as you round out into the final hour of trading on this Tuesday afternoon. Stocks relatively unchanged on the day with the Dow and S&P in the red. The Nasdaq straddling the line between gains and losses. A full breakdown of all the market action after the break. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in a rainy New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. A mixed bag here uh, in U.S. equity markets. I mean, actually, we should just say uh, most of the major indices are actually in the red, fractionally so here. Uh, so not a huge concern given the big run-up that we had yesterday. Two-tenths of a percent on the S&P 500. One of the few bright spots, at least as far as the headline equity indices, the NASDAQ indices, the composite, and the NASDAQ 100, each up about a tenth of a percent. Yeah, not too much to get excited about here, of course. Uh, it feels like all of the things that uh, will catch our attention are towards the end of the week. Uh, uh, starting with that Thursday CPI print earning season kicking off yeah. once again uh, for right now it definitely feels like a holding pattern. Well you missed one big event here if you it's can flip up me. the board. I'm told I, a little birdie I don't know where I heard this from oh, no. that apparently a spot Bitcoin ETF of some kind or another might actually get approved within I, the I next feel, 24 hours or so. I feel nervous yeah. talking about it because we've been waiting yeah. for it for so long. Yeah. Uh, it's, of course it's really picked up steam in the last six months or so but yes theoretically. Is, that, is this going to be a real catalyst though for just an expansion, I guess, of this industry, and more importantly, just a broader breadth of buyers. And it's not just the crypto faith who come on with their little baseball caps and their Lambos, and it's going to be like real people, <laughs> you know, with real retirement funds actually investing in this. That is the big question that people yeah. in the crypto industry don't really want to talk about, because yeah. at this point, uh, of course, the sort of persnickety yeah. case would go that if you wanted Bitcoin exposure, yeah. you probably have it yeah. by now. You've it's figured like gold out bugs, a way. right? <laughs> Remember gold was supposed to be like the next big thing yeah. 10 years ago and 20 years before that and 20 years before that. And, yeah. 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 Well, it's anyway. digital gold to some people. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to the real world. Let's talk about some uh, equities that are moving today because it is exciting under the surface. I want to start with uh, Tilray here having a terrible day, getting smoked, if you will, down almost 10 oh, percent. <laughs> it released. How, its, how, long uh, did you, how long did you did, did you work on that one? Uh, while, <laughs> I'll, basically an hour. But anyway, uh, it released its second quarter results and uh, initially it gained. Now it's reversing that. Uh, so we'll continue to keep an eye on that. I do want to uh, go right through this and let's talk about Urban Outfitters because it is a big week for those retail names we heard from Abercrombie. This, uh, is, this is insane to me. What, I why? mean, Because I, I felt like at, towards the end of the last year everybody was saying all these apparel companies, all these retail companies were basically kind of left for dead. Consumer spending has run its course. Now they're all raising their targets for the Not year. Not dead yet. Yeah. Especially not Urban Outfitters. Uh, you're exactly right. Yeah, another uh, beat and a boost here. Uh, again, a big week for retailers. We they the sell all thing. those like funky t-shirts, right? They do. Well, yeah. they have a, the, a portfolio of brands. Apparently Free People and Anthropology Free are people. doing really well. Oh, anthropology. I don't shop yeah. there. Uh, I'm not yeah, cool enough. Either. But Urban yeah. Outfitters, the actual namesake. Brand. I'm actually too cool for it. Yeah, I would imagine yeah. so. <laughs> well, apparently someone's shopping there and the uh, shares are having a great day. And then finally, we have to hit JetBlue. We'll talk about this a little later as well. But Robin Hayes is stepping down, of course. And you can see the reaction there in the shares, currently down about 11% uh, in reaction. All right. Uh, interesting because we talk about this idea here of kind of uh, what's moving and what's not here. We're going to have a full breakdown as we are about one hour away from the closing bell. Stick with us. Our cross-platform coverage of today's top stories starts right now. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're joined right now by our colleagues Carol Master and Tim Stenevic. A welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and our partnership with YouTube here. A somewhat subdued day in equity markets, at least relative to what we saw yesterday and in the days prior. Carol Master, fractional yeah. losses for most of the major indices. Uh, with the exception of the NASDAQ, which holds in the green. Yeah, calling it a little bit of a meh day, right? It doesn't feel like the risk-off trade is certainly winning over uh, investors today. I think it's all about the churn, about kind of where the economy goes, what does the Fed ultimately do. So we're going to live kind of from data point to data point, uh, and we get a big one on Thursday, as we know. Having said that, 
it was interesting how you led into us, right? We're on radio, we're on TV, Wednesday? we're on streaming, we're like kind of all over the place. And I feel like how we watch, who we watch, where we watch continues to change. And X, formerly known as Twitter, um, continuing to evolve as well. And so they're out with um, some news uh, talking about um, partnerships aimed at really boosting X's ad revenue, which we know has taken a big hit uh, as many have turned away from that platform. So we're talking about maybe something with former CNN anchor Don Lemon, uh, also with a former uh, ESPN star. So Elon Musk, Tim, trying to figure out how to get people to go to that platform. Yeah, Don Lemon, Jim uh, Jim Rome, Tulsi Gabbard, former uh, congressperson. Jim Question. Rome, wow. What, yeah. yeah, what I do you think? Know, I don't know. I didn't know he was still alive. But yeah, Jim Rome. <laughs> he's going to be doing his show every <laughs> single day. Is he? Yeah. Every single day. Every seven single days day. Week. Exclusively, yeah. right? Exclusively. The other shows, it's yeah. like he's, first he's on spicy. X. Remember that time he got slapped? I don't remember that. Wow. Just what we need, uh, right? But, but you know, this is not anything new yeah. if you think about what Twitter has done for you. And BuzzFeed used to have a daily show oh, on Twitter. Wow. Uh, I mean, this is like, you know... Sign me up. Pivoting to, to video again. <laughs> the question is, is, you know, no, can Elon Musk... tell us how Musk, you really feel, yeah, Romaine. <laughs> can Elon Musk actually, you know, get people to advertise on the platform ahead of these programs? I mean, that's Apparently the whole not. idea here, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. is getting advertisers to actually put pre-roll video or like interstitial advertising video, uh, and you Jim know, Rome. with these shows. Who was it? Say Don Tulsi Lennon. Gabbard. Tulsi, Tulsi Lennon. Gabbard. Oh, yeah, okay. Tucker Carlson already does it. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And, I, and yeah. I will say that they've been generating some of the stories that happen on Twitter spaces and elsewhere. So I, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Time will tell whether they, or not they figure it out and bring back uh, the advertisers. Okay, so Carol's a fan. Carol will be watching. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Star Wars because uh, also on the topic of what we watch, how we watch it, uh, Disney, it says that its new Star Wars movie is going into production in 2024. Uh, the Mandalorian and Grogu uh, going into production oh. this year. That is the first new picture from the franchise in more than four years. I can't say I'm a fan, you, but... Uh, wait, huh? the new, first new one? The first new picture from the franchise. Oh, the more, movie. Yes. Because that doesn't count like the 25 series. That no. Exactly. <laughs> that, that basically fatigued us all from Star yeah. Wars. That's a cool you movie. can't get tired of Grogu. I don't know da, da, what Grogu da, da, is. Da, da, or Baby Yoda. Da, da, da. It's great music. Baby Yoda is yeah. Oh, my gosh. As are I you, understand. Uh, <laughs> Romaine, are you a fan? Uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, I, I feel like they kind of watered it down so much that it kind of takes some of the thing. But, you know, not to date myself, but, you know, the first movie I ever saw in the theater when I was a child. No was kidding. Star Wars, the original Star Wars. That's cool. I won't tell you what year that was. But what's really <laughs> funny is you go back and watch them, right? And they were considered kind of high tech and yeah. really, and, and they look so low tech now. So it's kind of interesting. What? Nostalgic. If you How go back to those you? original movies, come How on. Dare you. you have to put it in context. No. I think it's very realistic. Okay, you, can, can you go to X and I'll, I'll, I'll go to, you know, wherever there, Star Wars is going to There is a business story here, guys. It's the There's popularity of The Mandalorian. It was yeah. huge on streaming during the pandemic. It People was. love The Mandalorian. Yeah. So they're trying to, you know, take what the success of The Mandalorian. And at the same time, you know, the Marvel movies lately have not done well. So people are a little tired of superheroes. Can Disney pull it off with uh, Lucasfilm again? Stay tuned. Star Wars took in $10 billion in global ticket sales since the original film when Romaine went and saw it back mm -hmm. in 1977. Oh, oh gosh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What was the your force, first film, Karen May Master. the Force be <laughs> with you. What's that Mickey Mouse film that just yeah. went into? Oh, uh, yeah, Mike's right. Was that Steamboat <laughs> Willie? Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. We are so out of here. All right, All right. guys. Guys, we got to get, you know, we have like real guests. You know, yeah, so do we. All right, here. see you later. We'll be back, yeah. though, in less than an hour's time. We'll count you down to the close. Radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, and who else knows what platforms we may go to in this new year? We'll see you at four. And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television, counting you down to the closing bell. Just about 50 minutes to go until we get to the close of public markets. But let's focus a little bit right now on private markets. With the Bloomberg exclusive, Gallup Capital has just released its latest middle market report. It shows the sector remained strong last year, and that defied a lot of consensus estimates out there. Middle market private companies in the Gallup Capital Altman Index grew earnings by 16% during the first two months of the fourth quarter of 2023. Key sectors included technology, consumer, healthcare, and industrials. Pleased to say that the CEO of Gallup Capital joining us right now, Lawrence Gallup, and we should point out that uh, the firm has about $65 billion in capital under management. Great to have you here on the program. Thanks, Romaine. Very happy to be here. Absolutely. Let's talk about some of the earnings performance of these companies, because I thought the way it was written in the intro, it really defied a lot of consensus expectations, which I think might be an understatement, because coming into 2023, the expectation was we were going to see a lot of these companies wither away and die, and they did almost the opposite. 
Well, I think we've, we've been seeing for mm -hmm. five or six quarters mm -hmm. much more strength in our portfolio companies and the borrowers, which are primarily private equity-backed companies, mm -hmm. uh, than the consensus, even than we expected. We expected this quarter to be pretty good. We didn't expect it to be this good. I think what we're seeing in part is the ability of private equity firms to really add value, to help and accelerate adaptation in their companies. Sure, there's lots of stories about truth, true stories that the pace of new transactions for private equity has slowed down. But firms have really done a great job working on improving productivity, beating not just consensus, but beating the aggregates for the overall economy. Well, let's talk about the improving uh, pr productivity. We did hear a lot uh, from uh, private equity firms and other private capital firms that were working with these companies and the direct lenders as well, this idea of be more efficient, cutting costs where you can now in the absence of at least what in the moment was basically little to no growth. Well, I think we're seeing growth. Mm -hmm. So so I, at least in the, the sectors we're involved in, I kind of reject the premise that there's no growth. But mm -hmm. the increase in interest rates has okay. really transferred the margin of safety from the borrowers to the lenders. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's been pretty good for us. That has grabbed people's attention. And what we've seen as a difference in the way private equity firms prioritize and the way management teams prioritize is return on investment decisions have a lot fewer adjustments on them. Time frames are lower, expected rates of return are higher. Growth just for growth's sake isn't there, it's growth for growing profits. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as much as we think about private equity firms as always being focused on improving the value of businesses, mm -hmm. you know, 12 years of zero interest rates, you know, got a little bit to everybody. Well, on the topic of uh, private equity, one of the interesting points uh, in this report is that you write that despite some of the headlines that we're seeing about PE-backed companies, there's a lot of bearishness around uh, how those companies are faring. You actually found that they're doing pretty well, that the returns are pretty strong. Are you able to quantify that? Just how strong is strong? So I think it's really important to distinguish between valuation and what returns to limited partners might be and the growth in EBITDA. You know, private equity firms got uh, ahead from a multiple point of view in terms of what they paid for companies in general in 19, 20, 21. So the multiples were high and there was an excess optimism about EBITDA adjustments. There were adjustments that just haven't come to pass. So what we're seeing is a natural cycle of a period of optimistic projections, uh, optimist, optimism based multiples, and now real EBITDA growth is catching up. And I think what we'll see in the second half of this year and the first half of next year, that private equity firms, that the companies have really grown into their valuations. Mm -hmm. Growing into their valuations. And I do want to back up a little bit and just talk about the business of private lending. Uh, this is a conversation Romaine and I have been having with people about, you think about what we saw in March, whether you want to call it a banking crisis, a banking hiccup, uh, you know, definitions there vary. But when it comes to the boom that we're now seeing in private credit, would we be having this conversation? We, would we still be seeing some of the uh, big numbers that we're seeing some of these private lenders put up had we not experienced that financial system stress last March? I, I think so. You know, the, the age of commercial banks actually holding loans to certainly middle market but even larger uh, borrowers in the private credit industry really diminished starting around 2000, 2001, 2002. What we've seen in the past couple of years is a diminished role for the big commercial banks, the money center banks, in arranging loans. And that's driven partly by the growth of private credit. I, I think that private credit provides PE firms a better value proposition, knowing your lender certainty, ability to take advantage of opportunities or deal with bumps. But we've also seen a slowdown in the formation of new CLOs, and the primary buyers of loans arranged by banks are CLOs. So we're seeing a long-term secular shift that I don't think really has that much to do with the Silicon Valley Bank type issues we, we faced early last year. I am curious with some of the private equity or firm, private credit firms, I should say, uh, is there more willingness now for them to hold on to some of these loans in a way that maybe in the past they would have either uh, tried to pass off to others or maybe even tried to renegotiate should there have been some sort of change in, in ownership of the underlying companies? Well, I, I think that when you talk about change of ownership, there, there is a, a growing degree of portability that sometimes gets negotiated in a new loan a new loan on an existing company where the private equity firm is thinking about selling it. They want to be able to sell the business with right. some certainty about the financing. So that's a, that's a relatively newer phenomenon. But historically, private credit, private lenders have been more flexible 
than broadly syndicated lenders mm -hmm. because there's the ability to actually come to some cohesive decision. You have one or two or five lenders. You don't have 30 or 40 lenders playing to some least common denominator. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, narratives that's emerged around private credit over the past year or so has been that with interest rates going much, much higher, like you said, uh, people maybe got used to that 12-year stretch of zero interest rates, that um, some of these borrowers were seeking out private lenders to get you know, better rates than they would at the banks. With rates now coming down, or at least poised to come down, do you see banks coming back as competition? Or do you even view banks as competition here? Look, everybody's a competitor in one way or another. Even some of the private equity firms are competitors with us uh, with their own credit arms. I think that the big banks are trying to adapt to a new world in which private credit has a much, much higher market share. I think that investors are seeking out private credit uh, in part because of the concerns some investors have that risk-free rates are going to come down. I mean, when you look at 5.5% treasuries that looked for a while like they might go to 6, you know, it's less exciting to think about a 9 or 10 or 11% return. But with the forward curves the way they are, I think we see some of the smartest advisors and smartest investors saying, hey, wait a minute, it's not just what are treasuries today, think about what you're going to be earning over the next three to five years. Yeah, that reinvestment risk uh, definitely front and center. And just to bring it back to your report before we let you go, so the middle market seems to be doing fairly well, but what are the concerns still out there? A lot of that macro bearishness may be overblown in 2023, but what are the risks in 2024? Well, I, I don't know that, uh, that the consensus is necessarily right about inflation. Wage growth is still very, very high. The, the tracker I like to look at the best is the Atlanta Fed. They have same job and change job wage trackers, which takes out the effective mix, more service jobs, less service jobs, and it's running five to six percent wage growth. Well, you know, maybe for private equity backed companies that really have high productivity growth way above the market, that's okay, but our productivity growth in the economy is just not there. We've got low unemployment, high wage growth, strong consumer demand. I think that uh, inflation is a risk. Another risk is we inherently don't really lend to interest rate sensitive sectors. And if rates should stay higher for longer, eventually that's going to have more impact on autos and housings and then some spillover effects. All right. Not out of the woods yet, at least when it comes to inflation. That's a good place to end it. Uh, Lawrence, it's really great to see you. Appreciate you coming by. Thank that you, is Katie. Lawrence Golub, CEO of Golub Capital. Now coming up, we'll take a look at Africa's fastest growing companies and the outlook for 2024. We'll do that with Runa Alam. She is CEO and co-founding partner of Development Partners International. Plus the very latest on the potential SEC approval of the first, yes, Katie, the first spot Bitcoin ETF in the U.S. I'll believe it when I see it. I uh, will also tell you which markets in the U.S. are seeing the biggest increases in home prices. All when? that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Options Insight segment, where we get you up to speed on the day's options trading. Our very own Abigail Doolittle standing by now with a look at whether the start of 2024 is similar to the start of 2022. Well, one reason, Romain, to think that it could be potentially is just that monster rally that we had at the end of last year, that uh, exuberant trading. And now in the new year, not so much. Very similar in some ways to 2022, except the selling this year, Steve Sosnick, chief uh, market strategist over at Interactive Brokers, quite a mouthful there. Uh, the selling this year doesn't feel as intense as I remember 2022. And another difference, I think that the first day or two of 2022, the rally extended and then all of a sudden we, we fell. Yeah, the high, the high in the the closing high in the S and P 500 was made on the first trading day of 2022. It's interesting. We kind of we weren't as furious at the end of 21 into 22, but the rally just petered out immediately. But you know, whereas this year we had that ferocious rally, I called it weaponized FOMO, just mm -hmm. because of everybody buying everything to beat their in order to beat their benchmark or or, or goose their year end performance. Um, it actually hasn't faded as quickly as I thought as it thought it might when the calendar turned. Although it was pretty clear it started to peter out a bit at the you know at the end or the Santa you know the lack of the Santa Claus rally. 
Yeah, and that can sometimes be a sign. In fact, the predictive value of uh, the non-Santa Claus rally or the Santa Claus rally pretty good. We didn't have one, so it may suggest that there's some pain ahead. And then the other side, there's the presidential election. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the Fed. Markets seem convinced that the Fed is going to cut six times. I know that you are saying that there's reasons that actually is not possible. Well, it's possible that they cut six times. But if they do, it's not going to be equity market friendly. It's very hard to come up with a scenario, and, and maybe it's possible, but I think the market is, is really drawing to a, a very unlikely prop, you know, combination of a soft landing, a, a, a decent enough economy that will get us high single digit to low double digit earnings growth, while at the same time an economy rotten enough to, to justify six rate cuts. I don't see how, they're, um, how they can occur at the same time, especially because we are in an election year and the, and the Fed probably does not want to be aggressively cutting unless they absolutely need to. And it's interesting, right now we're taking a look at a chart of the balance sheet versus the S&P 500, one of our favorites. And the Fed has done some nice work on that balance sheet. It's back below $8 trillion, But you can see that the S&P 500 has gone straight higher above it. Uh, so even if it flattens out, if we listen to Lori Logan's comments that maybe QT needs to lessen, it suggests maybe the S&P 500 is ahead of itself. Going well, back to Romain's question. Yeah, well, the other <laughs> point is we really, you know, the, the phenomenal performance that we had in 2023 was just getting back 2022. The S&P 500 at the end of 2023 was essentially unchanged from where it was um, at the end of, you know, the prior year. I'm sorry, you know, two years before. And same for the NASDAQ. It was up maybe, and NASDAQ 100 was up maybe about a percent and a half. So we really recouped a lot of ground. Let's see, let's see what powers us forward. One thing that seems likely in 2024, volatility. Yes. <laughs> Steve Sosnick <laughs> of Interactive Brokers, Chief Market Strategist there. Thanks so much for joining us for Options Insight today. And from New York, this is Bloomberg. Okay, Romaine, which city in the U.S. do you think had the highest home appreciation rate? Uh, I'm going to say Miami, Dade County area. I have surprising news for you because oh, according New to... York City. No. According... Los Angeles. No. Boston. Detroit. What? It posted... Michigan? Yes, it oh. posted the highest year-over-year -year home price increase among the nation's top 20 markets, clocking a 9.2% gain that is beating out Miami's 8.3% rise. This is according to Core Logic data. Uh, huh. Pretty surprising. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, obviously they're coming from a much lower base yes. than, say, Miami and some of the other uh, cities that we have on that list, like Charlotte and New York New and Atlanta there. here. But still, that's still pretty alarming. I don't know. I, how do people in Detroit feel about this? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I guess if you own a home, that's good. But if I'm, you're trying to buy one, no. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, to your point that it's a lower starting uh Point. If you take a look at the data from Zillow, it shows, Zillow rather, it shows that the average price of a single-family home is about $239,000. That is the actually the least expensive of the top 20 metro areas. So quickly increasing, but also yeah. uh, quite a rise to need to get to the average home price in Miami, which is more than uh, double that number. Well, it's interesting, too, because I was looking at uh, in our story, we talk about some of those cities that are at the top of that list actually are probably uh, in risk of the biggest price declines going forward. Also on that list I thought was interesting, the only big city that saw a decline in pricing, yeah. San Francisco. There you go. Down two and a half percent. So there you go, Katie. You're looking for a home. Go out west. This, this is, is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. <laughs> This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day. A mixed bag in markets right now. Katie Greifeld, a big change from what we saw over the last few sessions. Yeah, you take a look at the sector level, and it looks a little heavy at this moment. A lot of red on the screen behind me. You look at what is having a good day, and you do have tech up top there. The tech sector up about three-tenths of a percent. So not huge gains that we're talking about. Communication services and healthcare managing to stay green right now. Then you go down the list. What 
isn't doing too well. And at the bottom, you have real estate, you have materials. And uh, for another day, you have energy currently off by about 1.6%, Romain. Yeah, we talk about uh, some of the big movers uh, on an individual basis on the day here. We sp spoke about it a little bit earlier with Urban Outfitters. Those shares up about 7%. Remember, a lot of these retailers and apparel makers really trying to get ahead of this ICR conference. So basically, you have to disclose their outlook for either for 2023, that final quarter of 2023, or for the new year going forward here. We've heard from uh, Crocs. We've heard from Lululemon. We've heard from Abercrombie & Fitch. We've heard from American Eagle and now from Urban Outfitters. And they all seem to be singing from the same hymnal, and that's that consumer spending is holding up. Meanwhile, a big rally today on Juniper Networks up about 22%. In fact, that's the biggest one-day gain for that stock in 20 years, confirming news reports from earlier that it is in talks with Hewlett Packard Enterprise to be bought for about $13 billion at its current price, uh, $36.94. That gives it a valuation of actually less than $12 billion here. So it'll be interesting to see whether that gap gets closed. As of yesterday, its market valuation was below $10 billion. Two other movers to keep an eye on Unity Software on the taking a leg down. This on the back of cost cuts and a repivoting of certain strategies as well as change in certain management and micro strategy and the rest of the crypto sphere on the back foot today as people still waiting for word out of the U.S. SEC as to whether they're going to approve a spot Bitcoin ETF. Katie? Let's go from the U.S. markets over to investing in emerging markets, particularly in Africa. For more on her outlook, I'm pleased to say we're joined now by Runa Alam. She is CEO and co-founding partner at Development Partners International. Runa, it's great to have you with us. And let's start broad here. What is the bull case on Africa in 2024? Well, it's interesting because it's the new year and things have changed in Africa. We come into this year with certain parts of Africa having double digits inflation, devaluation, two defaults, Ethiopia and Ghana, and a host of other economic problems, not all over Africa, parts of Africa. We get into the new year and the World Bank, IMF, is now projecting growth for Africa. In fact, six out of the 10 top growing countries this year are meant to be in Africa, 18 out of the top 30. So all these uh, companies, countries, sorry, will be growing at 5% or more a year. And the next five years, Africa is meant to outperform not just the developed markets, mm -hmm. but other emerging markets. So a great outlook for this year. What exactly is fueling that? Is this driven by an increase in population? Is this driven by an increase in entrepreneurship? What exactly is driving it? There's some very fundamental trends in Africa that are really uh, quite staggering. So population, one out of every four humans in the world by 2050 will be in Africa, quarter of the world's population. And then Africa is going to be adding 800 million new people into the workforce by 2040. That is the biggest amount of any region in the world. Then you add to that uh, urbanization, fastest urbanization in the world, 13 more cities to be added uh, in Africa of over 5 million people a year. So that means that a significant number of people moving into urban areas. You have then digitization, a very big story in Africa, mm -hmm. where digitization is driving tremendous growth in consumption. And finally, education. A significant number of people in Africa are getting to that uh, a literacy level, and significant number of countries are going to be at that level of 60 to 70 percent literacy, which drives development and growth. So a lot of significant trends in Africa. Well, then talk about sort of where then the money leads based on that. Um, obviously, you can talk about your own investments over the past year or what you maybe plan on doing in the year forward. But is it going to be about, I guess, some of the more traditional sectors that we always talk about, such as like fintech and obviously commodities and infrastructure? Or is there something more to it than that? I think the key to investing in Africa is having flexibility, flexibility to go to certain regions. You have Francophone Africa, which is growing at five to six percent a year, very low inflation. And really, the companies there are we're talking about a rising tide is lifting ships. And then you have the rest of Africa, which may have other economic issues. And there you have to really navigate into certain sectors and you have to really invest with these trends remain, as you said. So really what we're looking at is digitization companies that are uh, in that space and growing at, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, sometimes more than that, sometimes 100 percent. 
we're looking at financial institutions and fintech. Um, and there, it's not only digitization, which the sector is benefiting from, but Africa is making a structural change into services. Mm -hmm. And you still have many underbanked people. So that's another area. And then manufacturing, parts of manufacturing, pharma, ag business, anything that really is catering to those trends, that middle class person in an urban area. And that's really where the growth is this year. And it's navigating to avoid certain problems also. So those are the sectors and the regions. As far as the investments uh, that you're making there at DPI, is it more advantageous to you to do more direct investment or is there a passive approach that investors could actually take that would actually still provide some modicum of a risk return balance? Well, the way we invest is exactly the opposite, not at all passive. And I think private capital is one of the best ways of navigating out of problem areas and also getting into the trends. Reason for that is not much of the digital economy and not much of the economy overall is not yet in the public sector, in the listed stocks. So really the choice lies in investing, choosing the investments right to invest in those um, areas. And private capital, of course, we can work with companies to really digitize them. So even our retail companies, our logistics companies, our agribusiness companies, our specialty chemical companies, we're working on digitization there. Example, Celevo, which is a specialty chemicals manufacturer in Francophone Africa. Good region, but really what we're doing there is digitizing. An app was created to increase revenues. Look at Kofina, also in Africa, uh, in Francophone Africa, lending to small and medium-sized companies. Digitization is really going to help um, get the revenue up, lower the cost of acquisition of new customers. So really, it's the story of following the trends by being in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So digitization, obviously an opportunity there. Have to be selective though. I do want to circle back to the point you made about some of these economic challenges. When we had you on the program back in September, I mean, when you think about the headwinds, the conversation was really around high inflation, debt burdens, uh, increasing rates, et cetera. What industries are feeling that the most in Africa and that you might stay away from? I think it's really as to what you want to be in. There's lots of industries that you want to stay away from. So the really the way we're investing, we're really still looking at very defensive companies, companies that either uh, the demand exceeds supply. So and then there's many areas like that in Africa just because of the growth of the population and the middle class and of, of consumption. So really, it's more getting into the sectors you want to get into rather than avoiding certain sectors. There's just too many of those that you want to avoid. All right, Runa, always uh, great to talk to you. We'll talk again soon, I'm sure. Uh, Runa Alam, she's the CEO and co-founding partner over at Development Partners International. Her outlook for investments in Africa for the year ahead. As we move closer to the closing bells here on the Tuesday afternoon here in the U.S., a focus on the top three big folks that we're keeping an eye on on the day. That's coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we do a deep dive into the people at the center of today's top stories. Joining us now, Scarlett Fu. Scarlett, who are you watching? I am watching Joanna Garrity. She is stepping into the CEO role at JetBlue once Robin Hayes steps down. And in doing so, she becomes the first woman to lead a major US airline. But she's leading JetBlue uh, through a pretty challenging time. Of course, uh, they had a recent failed partnership with American Airlines, and they're looking to acquire Spirit Air and waiting for a federal court ruling on whether that's going to move forward or not. Yeah, that's been interesting. I mean, Robin Hayes, of course, was just like a giant in this industry. It'll be interesting to see. I, I don't know much about her, but obviously she's been with the company for a long time. She's the so there should president. be so there should some be some degree of continuity between uh, him moving on and her taking over. It's worth noting as well, JetBlue shares are down as much as 11 percent. Yes, there was a downgrade, but the news of that plus uh, this unexpected resignation from Robin Hayes combined means a uh, down day. Yeah, absolutely here. Uh, another person I'm keeping an eye on is actually over in France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, 
who we all know, of course, you know, he leads France. He appointed a new prime minister. Hmm. And guess what? He's 34 years old. Uh, Gabriel Atta, he's only 34. He's going to be the youngest uh, prime minister in uh, France's modern history, we should say here. You see him there uh, walking up the steps. I'm not sure what you were doing at 34 years old, uh, Scarlett. And Katie, <laughs> when you get to 34 <laughs> years old, I hope you rise to the level uh, that this young man has risen. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll be uh, France's yeah. prime minister. Yeah, I was yeah. saying everyone in France is so young, at least in government. Uh, it's pretty amazing uh, to see this. He's also uh, the first openly gay man to head the government in France, uh, and of course the youngest to hold the post in modern history. So uh, a lot of superlatives attached there. Yeah, apparently at 34, um, Atal plus Macron, who's 46, would make them both younger combined than Joe Biden, who's 81 years old. Yeah. For anyone who's keeping score. It says yeah. a lot about France. It says a lot about the U.S. We should as also well. point out that, you know, France has had some young leaders before. You know, was it Louis XIV? Wasn't he like four years old or five sure. years that's old? That's how modern when French he took history, over. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty young to be the leader yeah. of a nation. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what I was doing at 34, but I definitely know at age four or five, <laughs> I was not doing anything productive. Yeah, I was very busy, but I was not <laughs> leading the government. Let's talk about Mike Mayo, though, because he's the Wells Fargo Bank analyst. We all know him well. He's also a power lifter. Uh, he's convinced that shares of U.S lenders are poised for a liftoff of really we're talking about him because what an incredible photo that was uh he is the subject of a profile in bloomberg news today uh basically just chronicling how he's known for going uh toe to toe with some of these big bank executives but he thinks that finally uh, we're going to see a liftoff for those shares especially for citigroup he's particularly bullish yeah city is actually no longer the least loved bank stock because in addition to getting a big buy from mike mayo uh, hsbc just raised city to buy and cut Morgan Stanley to hold. So Morgan Stanley is now the least loved big bank stock. Yeah, well, and Mike, of course, was out in front of that if you really want some entertainment. I feel like he's mellowed a little bit. But you go back <laughs> a few years ago and you just look at some of the transcripts from those conference calls where he was asking questions of the various bank leaders. Uh, Fisticuff. Feisty, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Feisty is a good word. All right, a lot more coming up here on the big program as we count you down to the closing bell. Melda Mergen, Columbia Threadneedles, global head of equity, is going to be joining the big program in just a minute. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're just about 10 minutes until we get to those closing bells. Stocks have been oscillating all day long between gains and losses. But now as we get closer to those bells, Scarlett, uh, hitting session lows here with the Russell 2000 down more than a percent on the day. NASDAQ down about two tenths. Yeah, I feel like we're really still consolidating yesterday's gains. Uh, big tech leading the way, small caps trailing, as you mentioned. And it's I mean, I guess it's a sign that we have all this news events uh, back ended in the second half of the week. You've got spot Bitcoin ETF approval, maybe by tomorrow. Uh, the CPI, PPI reports coming in and, of course, earnings on Friday. So until then, waiting game. Yeah, a lot of people waiting, I guess, for something. I don't know. Maybe they will find that opportunity, depending on the data, depending on those earnings, depending on whatever happens with sentiment after we get word as what's happening with that spot Bitcoin ETF. As we count down to the closing bells here on this Tuesday afternoon, Melda Merkin is joining us right now. She's Columbia Threadneedle's global head of equities. And uh, Melda, we talk about this idea of market sentiment, where it was, where it's going, more importantly, where it's at right now. Do you see it as being constructive? I would say generally, yes, we ended 2023 constructive and coming into 2024, a lot of optimism about uh, soft landing is priced in. So I would say generally the sentiment is, is positive, constructive. But as you suggested, uh, earnings season will start. So I'm sure there's a lot of waiting game going on, too. I know the first uh, you know, couple weeks of a new year, you can't put too much uh, into the price uh, reactions as there's a lot more going on uh, other than just the macro, other than just fundamentals. But once we get into the heart of earnings season and we start to hear how these companies performed in the fourth quarter and what their outlook is for 2024, will those corporate fundamentals justify some of that increase in valuation? I think yes. The, the short answer is yes. We'll find some of that uh, justification in the earnings and uh, company management um, uh, communication with the market, uh, the, especially the companies we are invested in. We find them very realistic in their expectations and generally also managing the expectations of the investors pretty well. So I would say um, I'm not expecting very big surprises during this season. 
What do you anticipate hearing from the big banks when it comes to uh, credit quality, when it comes to demand for loans that will kind of shape uh, the view going into the earnings season for the rest of the companies? Um, I, I would expect everybody being cautiously optimistic. I think there are definitely signs suggesting soft landing uh, in the way of consumers still being pretty um, healthy, uh, although we are starting to see some cracks, especially on the lower end of the income. But there's still a big debate around uh, the excess savings, how much it is spent, how much it is left. Um, the, generally, we are hearing the credit quality, as I said, although some cracks are are being realized is generally good. So I would say generally cautiously optimistic is my expectations. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring up um, the issue with savings and the health of the consumer because heading into this year, uh, or I should say 2023, there was this concerned that we were headed for recession, but the consumer really did surprise everyone. I guess the question is, do they still have the strength, the wherewithal to navigate another half year of uh, not rising rates, but higher for longer interest rates at this point? I, I would say it differs uh, when you look at the, the income distribution. So it's not going to be tr true for all the consumers that they still have the excess savings and, and really that, that um, dry powder to, to navigate this environment. That being said, uh, it's never been the really sustainable uh, key factor for, for the consumer uh, health and wealth. So it needs to be supported by employment. So unemployment rate and hiring and firing decisions will be very critical in the first half of 2024 for continuous consumer health. Uh, when we talk about uh, the health of the economy and the, of the consumer, which of course is effectively the economy here, Melda, are, are there concerns at all about, I guess, some of the potential black swans and gray swans that could come out of nowhere? We've been talking a lot about supply chain disruptions and everybody remembers what happened during the pandemic. We've been talking about geopolitics, of course, with a major election here in the U.S. and several election, major elections going on abroad here. How do you factor that into your outlook? Uh, geopolitical risk and U.S. elections, I think, are expected headline risks in 2024 for sure, and that will create more volatility and shorter-term movement in prices. Um, uh, we know that U.S. elections especially, of course, will set some of the expectations for the longer term, but they always been more shorter-term volatility. I am still a little bit worried about um, the, the private sector debt and, and, and what that means in the way of the depth and the breadth of the risk. I don't think we know really well. So commercial real estate and where that uh, credit cycle is, I think, something we need to watch very closely in 2024. Um, and that's where I, I'm, I'm not fully uh, convinced that uh, this is over yet. Uh, well, then what do you make of some of the price action that we saw, particularly towards the end of last year, when everybody seemed to be bidding up risk assets in a much broader fashion than what they were willing to do the few months prior here? Is the optimism not warranted? I think if you look at S&P 500, large cap, mid cap, and when I talk about the, uh, my worry about the debt and the credit crunch, I would say uh, corporations actually having access to capital markets position themselves pretty healthy. So corporate balance sheet is not a worry. But if you ask about uh, what is not known, it is more on the small business side in the way of their need for credit and where we are with that cycle. Uh, that's where I'm more worried about. So when you think about what happened last year in the market and coming into 2024, I wouldn't say that it was um, a, a kind of a uh, uh, too optimistic. Most of these companies, as I said, are managing their balance sheet and, and investor expectations pretty well. Melda, final question to you. Do you anticipate any repositioning from the launch of uh, the Bitcoin spot, Bitcoin ETF, when it does happen? What might investors rotate from within equities to make room for uh, this ETF? Um, I would say it wouldn't be um, the, the same type of allocation decision. So I, I'm not really in favor of moving from equities to that ETF as a one-to-one -one replacement. So um, it's hard for me to answer that question specifically. But I would say uh, for equities, I always um, tell our clients it's a long-term investment. So trying to time it is really hard. So I would definitely um, hope that the investor stays with their strategic allocation to equities um, at all times.
All right, Melda, always great to talk to you. Melda Mergen over at Columbia Thread Needle, helping us count down uh, to the closing bell uh, here on this uh, Tuesday afternoon. And we started that conversation, Scarlett, with all the major indices uh, deep in the red. The Nasdaq flipping back into the green. So we are off session lows, but most of the major indices still nursing losses. Yeah, I don't think you can really draw any conclusions from what's happened over the first four, five trading days of 2024. The S&P 500 down 0.1%. The Russell 2000 off 1.9%. Does it really set the tone for anything at this point? Uh, no. Uh, we should point out that yields uh, are modestly lower here on the day. Uh, as we move closer to the closing bell, our full market coverage right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You heard I'll take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Carol Masser and Tim Senevic. A welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms. That includes television. It includes radio. It also includes Bloomberg Originals. And Carol Masser, it also includes those folks who are still streaming us on YouTube. That's absolutely. We are kind of across so many different platforms. Um, having said that, you talked about kind of the equity trade. Are we on X yet? Uh, Not yet. No. TBD. Um, uh, you talk about the trade today, and you did see a little bit of an uptick here in these final few minutes of trading. But having said that, I kind of been obsessed watching that. We just talked about fixed income here. Um, the 10 year just kind of staying at that 4% level. It does feel like investors have certainly kind of rethought where that 10 year should be, but does it mean it should be even higher? And I'm just thinking about that inflation print on Thursday. Does it end up bucking higher because inflation is still a problem? Well, Andre Skiba over at. Uh RBC Global Asset Management. We just spoke with him, and he certainly thinks so. He thinks that inflation data could come in, Scarlett, a bit hotter, at least in the short term, so the 10-year could move higher. But he said it's unlikely to get to 5% again this year, like it got to in October. He still sees the Fed cutting rates this year, but only about 100 basis points, so less than the roughly 150 basis points that traders have. Yeah, increasingly in. I'm reading uh, comments about if the Fed does cut rates, it would have to be on the heels of a recession, and a mm. recession that's pretty notable for the Fed to take that move um, in a meaningful way. So you'd have to wait for news to get bad before the Fed moves forward. Yeah, I mean, those six rate cuts at one point that were priced in just seemed a little bit ridiculous here. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we talk about the machinations in the equity market here after that big rally yesterday. A bit of a pause uh, here on this Tuesday afternoon with the Dow Jones Industrial Average lower by more more than 160 points, or roughly about four-tenths of a percent as we wait for these numbers to settle. The S&P 500 is going to close lower by about seven points, or two-tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq Composite uh, going to hold in the green here, up slightly by about a tenth of a percent. Meanwhile, the Russell 2000, that was actually your big decliner here on the day, down one percent, Carol. All right, Romain. So just digging a little bit deeper into the S&P 500, more of a risk off trade here. Or I, we were kind of calling it a meh trade because it doesn't feel like there's a lot of conviction here. But having said that, Scarlett, you've got 358 names to the downside in the S&P 500, 144 gaining some ground, one unchanged. Yeah, and that's reflected when you look at the two dozen industry groups in the S&P 500. Only seven of those groups finished in the green, led by retail, and that's really Amazon. The chip companies gaining eight tenths of one percent, um, AMD and NVIDIA each up for a fourth day and health care or household and personal products just barely up as well. Um, I want to mention autos and components down more than 2%, telecom and energy all off by at least one and a half percent. All right, so a lot of red there. So having said that, here's some of the individual gainers. You guys, I'm sure we're talking about this. We're seeing like M&A activity talk certainly heat up here in the first couple of weeks of 2024. Juniper Networks, check it out, guys. Just finishing off its highs of the session, still a gain of nearly 22%. Number one gainer in the S&P 500, jumping the most in about two decades on news that the company is in advance talks to be sold to HPE. So we're talking about Hewlett Packard Ent Enterprises. Um, HPE may acquire Juniper for about $13 billion, according to folks in the know. This was initially reported in the Wall Street Journal um, in terms of a deal happening announcement. They were saying could come as soon as today. We haven't seen it yet, but yeah. we'll see. We're definitely keeping a I'm watch a on it. I was surprised by this. I remember what? early, obviously, this was just kind of reporting speculation, and then the company confirmed it. But it kind of makes you wonder why HPE would even want what is still effectively largely a hardware business, but obviously they know something I don't. Well, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. You go back to the right, the splitting of Hewlett Packard, the old Hewlett Packard, yeah. uh, and this is much more what the services side, yeah. the enterprise side. So it is kind of interesting. I do think. I mean, there must yeah. be some synergy there that, that obviously uh, 
you know, the executives there see. Let's get Antonio Neri on. Investors would certainly hope he'll there's us. some synergy. You, he'll tell us why. That's what we'll do. Share your strategy with us, please. All right. Uh, let me get to the number three gainer in the S&P, the number two gainer in the NASDAQ 100. We're talking about Illumina, 4.5% higher uh, out with preliminary fourth quarter results that included fourth quarter revenue that's higher than expected. Cowan weighing in, saying it's a good start under the new CEO. So keep in mind, been some changes uh, in the top job over at Illumina, and so interesting to see that this company, at least with a little bit yeah. of an outlook, uh, that's upbeat. Do you want to mention? How, how are Illumina prices doing right now? Illumina? Yeah. I don't know. Like uh, Illumina? Like Illumina? Mean like aluminum? <laughs> He's trying. Are you Carry making on. a joke? Homonyms here. Carry I'm on. trying to be. You know, we, markets are serious stuff. Yeah, that's right. Let's get serious. They're bio, you know, life sciences. <laughs> that kind of. Oh, you're killing me. All right. This is courtesy of Tim Stanovic, who said, "Hey, did you see this? Because U.S. and Canadian uranium companies. That's what you meant. Uranium prices. That's, that's what, what you meant, meant right? Yeah. yeah. Meant All right. Surging in trading. The U.S. Energy Department coming out. Uh, they began seeking contract bids for domestic uranium production. And so one of the players that really uh, shot up today, Global Atomic. It's based Based in Canada, uh, the ADR is up about 9% in today's trade. Um, and then NVIDIA, just have to mention, up another 1.7%. I believe closing, yep, at an all-time high today, uh, rolling out some new chips to help the PC industry. That was yesterday's news, AI PCs. But nonetheless, guys, the top performing name in the S&P 500 last year, investors still kind of love it this year. All right, let's take a look at some of the decliners. I want to start with Boeing. We've got to take another look at Boeing. Shares down for another day today, down 1.4% after yesterday's route. This in the wake of that near calamity on Friday on that Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9. Uh, we are set to get some information from Dave Calhoun because he's set to press workers to focus on safety. That's Boeing's CEO. Um, he wants to tell the employees that it's a top priority. This at an all-hands meeting that's set to happen momentarily if it hasn't kicked off already. Yeah. Um, senior leaders are stressing the need for staff to work to a high standard following last week's did, fuselage blowout. Did they yeah. not have that standard That's what already? I had the, I I mean, said I the same thing I think when you put a tin can in the sky, you would think pri uh, safety would yeah. be number one priority. Yeah, and this is an yeah. ongoing issue, certainly, at, yeah. at Boeing. Hey, speaking of planes, let's check in on shares of JetBlue, because uh, shares of JetBlue falling significantly today. This is the result of a downgrade. Shares uh, finished it down by 10.2%, though it fell as much as 11%, a little earlier in the session. An analyst at Bank of America Global Research downgraded JetBlue from neutral to underperform, saying that the company faces a host of issues, including a tough domestic environment, as well as those ongoing engine issues with the Pratt & Whitney GTF engines. Um, of course, Not to mention a new CEO, right? Yeah. There we go. Somebody Yesterday after the bell. Somebody who has been at that company for a long, long time in different positions. Yeah, Robin Hayes uh, stepping down yesterday. Um, the company announcing that Joanna Garrity, currently the company's president and COO, will succeed Robin Hayes as a CEO, effective February 12th. Uh, and then, Carol, you mentioned Juniper Networks. I want to talk about HP and see how shares of HPE closed on the day. Uh, investors saying, wait a second, you're spending a lot of money on Juniper. Shares down 9% for Hewlett-Packard. It's like they heard well. Romaine's thoughts. They yeah. did. Have yeah, you been I, talking about this all day, Romaine? Yeah, well, I think, uh, well, we've mentioned a couple times on the, on the television program. I am curious to see what the rationale is for it once they uh, do actually come out with the more, more details here. I mean, I guess I could see how this could uh, dovetail with some of the software offerings. But again, that's a lot to take on. Uh, maybe they have a plan for it. Uh, let's check in on the yield space uh, real quickly here. And I do mean real quick because not a whole lot happened today here. Uh, basically, the entire yield curve did shift a little bit lower, but only by about one to two basis points, depending on what part of the curve you're at. So that is that holding pattern. As a lot of folks are awaiting the next wave of economic data, which would include the CPI report this week. And then, of course, waiting uh, for more uh, clarity here as to how companies performed in the fourth quarter with the start of the earnings season, which ostensibly kicks off over the next couple of days. You know, Carol, you mentioned that 4% yield and how tightly the 10-year is hugging that level. It's clearly a level of support, but according to Bill Gross, the former bond king, um, he says the 10-year at 4% is overvalued. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. We talked about that. I, I feel like that there is, I don't know, I, I think we continue to see it bump up against this 4% level. So I do feel like we need some more data points to figure out where should it really settle here in the new year. But, um, but, but wasn't that kind of the level? I mean, we've heard from so many uh, 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 investors on this program, they have talked about kind of that 4%, kind of between 4 and 4, one, four two. That was kind of the sweet spot where you would get that yin and, yin and yang, that pull mm -hmm. of people selling and people buying, and that that would kind of keep the rates kind of pinned there for a while until that all shakes out. Yeah, and Andre Skibo uh, over at R RBC, who we just spoke to, said yeah, that he knows so many though. investors, yeah. knows what? so many investors who want to buy this at 4.2 or 4.3%. No. Those who waiting. missed out at 5%. Yeah. 
Well, maybe the CPI numbers and the PPI numbers, as we mentioned uh, th later this week, uh, will get us moving in that well, direction. Don't you feel like, though, that there's more and more people who are saying, listen, I think we're overestimating that maybe we're done with inflation, we got it all under control. I keep feeling that more conversations, especially of market watchers, saying, you know what, we maybe are underestimating that we could see an uptick in inflation. I feel like that Shipping would be a Shipping costs, everyone. Shipping yeah, costs. for example, right? Yeah, and it gets to the idea, though, too, as to whether rates are really going to materially move much lower than where they are right now. I mean, you think about just how far they've fallen from those peak levels that we had last year, mm -hmm. but that pretty much seems commensurate with where we are with monetary policy and, more importantly, with economic conditions right now. So in order to get us down, say, another percentage point, you would have to have a, a significant change in economic conditions to do that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, we got to wrap up. But I do have one question, Romaine. What are alumina prices? Alumina prices going? Up? I I don't know. I you tell me. Check it out. You were just talking about alumina. Alumina go. You? It's on the oh. Bloomberg. <laughs> okay. No, it's I'm not. not. Falling it's for that not. Again. All right, guys. That is a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage: radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. Have a good evening, though. We will see you again tomorrow. And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. All eyes right now on the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the potential approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Our next guest, though, says that might not actually be a good thing. Dennis Kelleher, CEO of Better Markets, joining the program in just a second. This is The Close on Bloomberg. An interesting day in U.S. equity markets this Tuesday, a mixed bag for stocks coming off what had been a pretty strong relief rally on Monday here. You can see the S&P 500 behind me closing down by about a tenth of a percent here. The Nasdaq did hold its own, but again, fractionally. The big decliner on the day, that was actually the Russell 2000 dropping more than a percent. You did see airlines uh, actually hold their own as well, despite a big downdraft that we saw over in JetBlue. You flip it up here, all eyes right now are on Bitcoin and, of course, the potential for approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Bitcoin prices did retreat just a little bit, but still holding around that 47,000 level. Most of the stocks tied to uh, the crypto sphere also moved lower here on the day. But remember, we're talking about stocks and we're talking about tokens here that are now riding what for many of them are almost a 100 percent gain just over the past seven to eight months alone. Of course, that is going to be the big story as we move into uh, the next uh, couple of days here, Scarlett, as we wait for that decision by the SEC. Absolutely. And most observers, of course, do expect the regulator to soon approve those spot Bitcoin ETFs. But our next guest has been arguing against it. In a statement, he says that approving these products would expose millions of American investors and retirees to the very harms that the SEC seeks to prevent. Joining us now is Dennis Kelleher, CEO of Better Markets, which is a nonprofit focused on financial policy. Dennis, it's good to speak with you. Um, when it comes to the spot Bitcoin ETF, this is something that the SEC doesn't necessarily want to do under Gary Gensler, but a court made the ruling that Grayscale was allowed to convert the trust into an ETF, and now the SEC is complying with it. Do you think the SEC should ignore the judicial branch and just not move forward with the spot Bitcoin ETF? Well, hi. Uh, thanks for having me, and good to be with you. Um, that's actually not what the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled. In the Grayscale case, what the court said was that the SEC acted arbitrarily and capriciously because it failed to explain sufficiently the basis for its decision. And it went through a number of things that it said the SEC did not articulate properly and thoroughly enough. And it sent it back to the SEC. So what the SEC should have done is better explained why they made their decision and why it was the right decision. Rejecting that ETF was the right decision. It is the, the law and the facts support saying no here. What's happening is the SEC is apparently almost certainly going to approve a trusted and familiar investment vehicle, an ETF, that will enable the mass marketing of a known, worthless, volatile, and fraud-filled financial product to Main Street Americans. And that's not only going to unleash crypto predators on tens of millions of investors and retirees, but it's also likely going to undermine financial stability. And it's going to compound all of that, Scarlett, because it will be interpreted and spun as a de facto SEC, if not government, mm -hmm. endorsement of crypto. And so that's going to give false comfort to people on Main Street thinking, oh, it's an ETF and the SEC agrees, so maybe it's not so bad. 
Well, Gary Gensler clearly Sorry. doesn't. Sorry, Scarlett, just yep. going to interrupt you right now. We are getting word that the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission ah. has indeed approved Bitcoin ETFs. That headline crossing the wire uh, right now. Uh, we are in conversation with Dennis Kelleher. We'll get back to him in just one second over at Better Markets. But the headline, as anticipated, Scarlett Fu, is that the SEC has granted approval for Bitcoin ETFs. Now, we don't actually have the list of approvals just yet here. It'll take us a while to dive into this statement. But, uh, and this, this is, is the what headline that everyone was, was expecting. Yeah. yeah. And there are 11 filings um, that the SEC is deciding on. Um, of course, the ARC one is the one that's in front of them first. I believe 14 have been filed overall, but uh, probably 14 won't be approved all at once. And the thinking here is that the SEC yeah. would probably approve a batch of them all at once as opposed to doing them one at a time because they don't want to give anyone a first mover advantage. Right. Ostensibly, this was really about the uh, um, the ARC uh, 21 uh, shares uh, yep. petition here. But as uh, Scarlett just said, uh, of course, it would kind of be a little bit awful to just approve that one and not actually address some of the other applications out there. Dennis Kelleher is still with us, uh, uh, who leads uh, Better Markets here. And De uh, Dennis, before the headline crossed the wire, you were making the case as to uh, why this would be a mistake. Uh, let's deal with the reality now, that now that this is approved here, is there anything that the SEC and other regulators can do to, I guess, provide more protections uh, for some of those investors that might now look at this as that tacit endorsement by the U.S. government? That's an excellent question, and the unfortunate answer is no. You know, the SEC's action has changed nothing about this worthless financial product. Bitcoin and crypto are still going to have no legitimate use. They're still going to remain the preferred product of speculators, gamblers, predators, and criminals. And they're going to continue to be cesspools of fraud, manipulation, and criminality in the trading of the spot market. And what's worse is that this decision is going to give investors the false comfort Many are going to think the SEC is endorsing crypto, and they're going to be using a familiar trusted investment vehicle like an ETF that they're already comfortable with. It's going to involve the legitimacy of traditional and trusted financial firms, not just crypto firms. And there's going to be this false belief that you just touched on, uh, Raphael, that, uh, a belief that there will be a meaningful regulation and in investor protections. But the truth is, there is and will be no effective cop on the Bitcoin beat. Yeah. And this gets to the question, though. Um, now that we're kind of going down this road here, uh, Dennis, do you think there will be legal challenges uh, to this um, to this decision? It's interesting. I think um, there are a number of organizations that will take a very hard look on the actual details of what they have to say. Um, I think litigation is unlikely, but I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I think this is going to be viewed by history and not distant history in the next few years as we see crypto carnage hitting Main Street investors and Main Street people saving for retirement, getting into this very volatile asset that's full of fraud and has wild um, you know, speculation going on. They, nobody can do a discounted cash flow on this product. This product is valued based on what people think the next guy might pay for it. It's very similar to a Ponzi scheme than any typical investment that most people think of when they think of making an investment. And yet the marketing might of these firms are going to start selling these things like crazy almost immediately because they're going to try and grab market share. And there's already a competition, a race to the bottom on the fees so that they can grab market share. But the problem is they're getting market share of a fundamentally um, fraudulent underlying product. All right, uh, Dennis, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we appreciate you taking time for us. Dennis Kelleher, uh, of course, is the co-founder and CEO over at Better Markets, making the case for while the latest decision by the SEC to approve a spot Bitcoin ETF might actually be wrong. Concerns here about retail investors and protecting them. Let's bring Shanali Basak into this conversation. She is our Bloomberg Wall Street a beat reporter. And just to reiterate the main headlines here, Shanali, a post on X crossing the wire now with the SEC approving that spot Bitcoin ETF. Do we have any other details as to whether this was a wholesale approval of all the applications or just the ARC 21 shares one? And it's a good question, too, because it's some of the uh, approvals that are out there that are required 
Grayscale is the number one we're probably watching because mm -hmm. that already has about 30 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. When will they start trading is what we're keeping an eye out for right now, as mm -hmm. well as some of these other applications. We talked to Hashtag, for example, which is changing from a futures product into a spot Bitcoin ETF product. So we're keeping an eye on all the filings, particularly when they start trading. And in the coming days, uh, how quickly each of them go, will they go at the same time and how much money they draw in. We should take a look at also at Bitcoin markets here because yeah. they're fluctuating still quite meaningfully. They are dropping just a little bit here. Uh, we are watching a 2.7% change on the day in Bitcoin prices. We are below at the moment uh, that 47,000 level. That is where futures were trading at into next week. Yeah. And so there has been a big, big question about whether this has been priced in or not. Mm -hmm. well, well, that's what I'm curious too, because in addition to the crypto pricing itself, the actual companies, of course, that are tethered to this, like Riot and Marathon, Coinbase, all moving lower. Some of them had, yeah. had, had spiked when the headline came out, but now they're in the red. And I do wonder, Scarlett, if this is is a sell the news situation and that it has priced in or whether there is concern here that this might not be as beneficial to the company. Yeah, well, with um, Bitcoin rising above $47,000 yesterday and today, there was a lot of anticipation that once the SEC did approve uh, these ETFs that it would be a sell the news kind of situation. And you have MicroStrategy, for instance, um, currently trading down in the after hours trade. It basically is a proxy for Bitcoin, uh, even though it's, a, it's an equity. Um, and of course, this is something that people had been anticipating in the days leading up to this announcement. What's interesting to me, of course, is that you have several filings before the SEC and a lot of these issuers have been slashing fees, competing with each other to attract attention and hopefully get some of those that early money coming in. Uh, a lot of them have uh, zero fees right now as a teaser rate before they then impose a 20 basis point fee or 30 basis point fee later on. One thing Romain was talking about earlier was this kind of sell the news moment. One thing that will determine that is how much money these firms draw in. Mm -hmm. And to your point, you have a couple of funds here that have introduced that teaser rate of nothing <laughs> for, for a little while at least. Bitwise, ARC21 uh, shares, and Vesco Galaxy, for example, being among those firms. But the ones that have slashed their fees, and there were four of them that did, you take, for example, Grayscale still at 1.5%. Valkyrie had slashed it to under 50 basis points over at four. 49 basis points. And so there is a very wide dispersion here. Now, remember, we were talking about Grayscale already has mm -hmm. a massive asset base. So the question is, uh, what kind of new money do they draw in? Do they lose some assets in this uh, fee war, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, interestingly and importantly, remember, if they are able, these issuers, particularly ones that are essentially offering investors nothing <laughs> uh, that they would have to pay to get in, yeah. should they draw a lot of money, those would be the ETFs then turning around and buying Bitcoin, right? And so if we see a lot of um, movement in the first couple of days, th that's the tension against the sell the news um, existence that we're yeah. talking about right now. All right, Shanali uh, Basic uh, joining us here. She's sticking with us here as we cover the big breaking news here. The SEC here in the United States uh, approving uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs, plural. That's based on a post uh, on the platform X. We should point out there are no details as to exactly whether the single application by ARC21 shares was approved or whether all of the applications that were out there were approved. Gary Gensler saying in, a in that X of posting here uh, that this enhances market transparency and provides investors with efficient access to digital asset investments within a regulated framework. Kaylee Lyons joining us right now uh, down in Washington, the co-host of Balance of Power, a co-host of our crypto show here, Kaylee. Uh, this was widely expected here. Uh, I think it's interesting, the framing, though, by Gensler, that this actually provides more transparency and greater surveillance and compliance. Yeah, it is interesting, Romain, considering just today out on X prior to these ETFs actually being approved, Gensler was once again warning about crypto investments being risky. He has said repeatedly in conversations with me and others that the crypto markets are rife with fraud and manipulation. And that was really the argument the SEC was trying to put forward in not approving these products and not approving them like they had a futures uh, product because spot prices, they said, were more subject to fraud and manipulation. Obviously, in the grayscale court case, that argument was effectively uh, shot down called arbitrary and capricious. And now I guess the spin is that this actually does provide um, greater safety perhaps to investors or at least provides that transparency as these are now going to be products approved and overseen by the SEC. They did point out in this statement on X that they will be subject to ongoing surveillance and compliance measures and compliance in crypto has really been what Gary Gensler is all about when it comes to this space. Yeah, it definitely feels like um, with the court ruling, Gary Gensler leading the SEC is kind of holding his nose while moving forward with allowing these spot Bitcoin ETFs to move forward. This is something he's doing, would it be fair to say, with great reluctance? 
<laughs> when I spoke with him last, Scarlett, I asked him about these spot ETFs, and what he told me is that the SEC acts in accordance with its authorities and how courts interpret its authorities, which to me felt like an admission that the courts are indeed forcing his hand here, that this doesn't necessarily mean that his view around crypto is changing, but he has to comply with what the courts are saying. I think it is an interesting question, though, about what this actually could mean for other crypto spot products going forward, considering the Grayscale case was so specific to Bitcoin and Bitcoin futures specifically. Does this signal that the SEC might be less hesitant or reluctant to approve similar products going forward, or are they just doing this specifically because one court mandated it? Is it going to take other legal challenges if we were to get a spot Ether or a spot Ripple ETF, for example? All right. In conversation right now with Kaylee Lyons, who's down in Washington. She's sticking with us. Shanali Basic with us here in studio in New York. And Shanali, there's going to be a lot of talk. I mean, assuming that uh, we start to see a rollout of some of these products here, there's a lot of talk about uh, what the adoption is going to be. Is this just going to be something where the crypto faithful just have another mechanism to invest? Or is this really going to draw in a broader section. And actually, uh, Shanali, uh, we have to actually uh, go back and clarify something here. Uh, we did report here that the SEC uh, had posted on X uh, that they had actually approved Bitcoin ETFs. A spokesman is now telling Bloomberg that Bitcoin ETFs have not received approval on this Tuesday here. So a bit of confusion here, and our apologies to our viewers if we are confusing you, but let's just walk through it here, Scarlett. We, uh, just a few minutes ago, we saw a post on X from the official Securities yep. and Exchange Commission account. With the great check mark. Had, saying that they had approved Bitcoin ETFs. Our Bloomberg reporters, as diligent as they are, of course, got on the phone to the SEC for some clarity, and the SEC is now telling them through a spokesperson that they have not done any approvals for Bitcoin ETFs. And I'm just looking at the original post um, posted on X right now. This is a post that's been viewed 2 million times. It's had 16,000 reposts, 30,000 likes. Um, and again, it even quotes Gary Gensler, the chair of the SEC, saying today's approval enhances market transparency, provides investors with efficient access to digital asset investments within a regulated framework. But again, our reporting indicates that for now, Bitcoin ETFs have not received approval on Tuesday. So, and to be fair, Romain, what we were yeah. discussing earlier with Chanali, we didn't have any further details beyond that post. It didn't indicate which ETFs were approved. And there's a slew of ETFs ahead of the SEC. We'll be doing a little reporting here to figure out exactly what happened. To your point, this did come from a checkmarked uh, account from the U.S. SEC. The SEC is now telling us at Bloomberg, a spokesman for the SEC, that uh, this was not meant to be sent out. I, we have to figure out exactly what happened here. I would say, I would say this, as we figure out what happened with the SEC's uh, Twitter account here, we do get a real-time reaction in Bitcoin markets mm -hmm. as to how the market would react yeah. when the SEC does uh, grant approval for these accounts. Now, again, the SEC says they have not yet granted approval for these spot Bitcoin ETFs. Something important about this most recent statement is we still are waiting to see if and when they do yeah. approve these Bitcoin ETFs and yeah. to your point remain in what order yeah. they do so. All right. Just to clarify uh, for uh, our, our viewers right now, we should point out there is a post on X, which as of right now is still up there from the official U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission uh, account uh, saying that it had granted approval for Bitcoin ETFs. Our reporters uh, did call the SEC and they were told by a spokesman there uh, that uh, they did not actually make that approval. And we now have further headlines here uh, from Gary Gensler himself saying that the SEC Twitter account was compromised Ooh. and that it says he did not approve Bitcoin ETFs. I want to go back down to Kaylee Lyons, who's down there uh, in Washington, of course, who have, has been covering this uh, for a, quite a long time here and, of course, has spoken with Gary Gensler uh, quite a bit here. I, I am curious as to how something like this, Kaylee, could happen. I wish I had the answers to that, Romaine. I will say, though, that this may be the kind of example of how easily this market can be manipulated uh, that Gary Gensler has been worried about. The idea that prices can swing very easily on a headline like this, or as it may seem, a, a fake post on Twitter. Gary Gensler, in his post, went on to say that the SEC has not approved the listing and trading of exchange traded products, which matches uh, what we heard from a spokesperson. But the fact that a Twitter account could be compromised perhaps raises more questions about that platform specifically specifically in how this happened, what it ultimately means for the potential eventual approval of these products is definitely a question. But again, you're seeing prices manipulated by headlines like this, and this has always been one of his, his primary concerns. Yeah, I'm just looking at the, um, the Twitter account or the X account here that posted that um, 
I keep wanting to say the word tweet, but it's not the tweet, uh, tweet anymore. And the last time it actually posted was on June 5th, 2023. There's a, um, a post here that is uh, pinned at the very top from 2022. So it's, it's really interesting here that if you go to the at SEC gov handle, they haven't posted this or anything recently. Um, so this is something to keep an eye on here as we try to sift through all the data. Um, we go back to Bitcoin prices and how they've been all over the place. They spiked and then they've lost ground. They're now down about 3%. MicroStrategy, uh, Shanali, which has become kind of a proxy for Bitcoin in many ways. It's a company, but they basically just buy Bitcoin, has moved in a similar direction. Yeah, Bitcoin now barreling down below 46,000. Remember, we have been sustained above that mark the last couple of days here. We even breached 47,000. These are the highest levels that we've seen since 2022. So very sensitive moments for Bitcoin itself. Um, a potential hoax here. Hoax here. Um, really impacting a market in real time. Again, we've been waiting for this SEC approval. There's no assurance that it will necessarily come. Uh, the Twitter account of the SEC seems to have been compromised. And now we're looking at, uh, you know, yeah. a question of uh, what happens from here in terms of how the SEC approaches this product. All right. Well, we're marshalling the full resources uh, that we have here at Bloomberg News. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu, Shanali Basic uh, along for the ride, as is Keeley Lines down in Washington. We do want to go out now to our uh, ETF uh, IQ extraordinaire, Eric Balchunas, uh, to talk a little bit more about what we know and, more importantly, Eric, about what we can expect. There was a deadline where they were supposed to make a decision. That deadline is still out there, right, Eric? Yeah, uh, tomorrow's the deadline. By the way, I have a theory on this whole thing. If, if you're reading the tweet, my guess is they, they prepared a tweet and they put the wrong day because if this tweet were to go out tomorrow at the exact time, mm -hmm. it would have made perfect sense with all of, all of our intel. We heard by uh, many good sources that the SEC had requested issuers to request acceleration tomorrow at 4 p.m. And then what that means is acceleration means you're then uh, going to be, be, be made effective. So effectively, we were expecting the 19B4s approved, the acceleration and everything to happen in a whirlwind between 4 and 5 p.m. tomorrow. Um, this tweet would have made perfect sense at that time. So my theory, we'll see what plays out, is it wasn't compromised, but that they just planned the tweet and they put the wrong day in. But I could be wrong. I will say that I still expect, we all expect high odds, almost like 99% at this point, that tomorrow they'll get approved and Thursday they'll trade. So uh, this is, just one of those never ending roller coaster days yeah. covering this. So, I mean, the, whoever was handling the social media responsibilities over the SEC made a mistake. If that's the case, why would Gensler say the SEC Twitter account was compromised? If the plan was all along to approve them, they could say, you know what, we published this early, but yes, this is the, the action we are going to take anyway. That's what happens oftentimes when companies are due to report earnings and it comes out a little bit earlier than expected. Like I said, that's my theory. Um, and maybe all it, it, somebody was compromised yeah. it, but I, I read the tweet. If you think about the the crypto world, I don't know if they're writing that kind of language. It really does sound SEC ish. Mm -hmm. uh, the way it was written, um, when they do pranks, you can almost tell sometimes that it's some knucklehead. Yeah, uh, this read very much like a real SEC uh, tweet. Yeah, in conversation with Eric Balchunas uh, over at Bloomberg Intelligence. I want to go back down to Washington, uh, where Kaylee Lyons, uh, co-host of Balance of Power, is still standing by. And Kaylee, we should point out here, if this was a compromised situation, if this was, as Eric is speculating, maybe a potentially they were setting something up on embargo and somebody just uh, you know, hit the wrong button or did put the wrong date in, we should point out it's been 20 minutes since that tweet went out. It's still up. Yeah, I keep refreshing the page, Romaine, to see if the tweet goes away and it remains up uh, on the SEC Gov official page. I don't know if that raises questions as to whether or not they are able to get into the account to delete it or if Gary Gensler's clarification on his own uh, personal account as the SEC chairman is supposed to yeah, provide clarity chilling. enough. But one would think that this would have been removed if indeed this this was a hoax if it was a um, hacking situation. I would just keep in mind that Gary Gensler's relationship with this platform and, and these things in particular uh, has often been a problem. If you remember, there was rumor circulating on this platform over the summer that he was actually resigning as chair of the SEC. That proved mm -hmm. to be um, untrue. So obviously a lot of headaches when it comes to 
this with the SEC. Yeah, and just looking at his personal uh, page, uh, the last time he posted was uh, on January 1st, to wish everyone Happy New Year, and there's nothing there's been nothing there since. Once we do expect to hear from the SEC formally in, in a way where they say this is what we actually posted, this is what we announced, what other information do we expect to go along with the announcement that uh, the Bitcoin ETFs have been approved? Well, theoretically, Scarlett, you would get the information on which ETFs we're talking about, knowing that there's about 11 in play of either new filings or a conversion in the case of Grayscale, a switch in strategy in the case of Hashdex. Usually there would be more specific information. And as always with any government agency, typically this information is available or would be put out in a press release on something like sec.gov. And I was not able to find that when I came on to address these breaking news in the first place, which maybe uh, is a tell. Theoretically, though, especially with all of the buildup to this decision, knowing that they were facing down this deadline and everyone is awaiting news on this, it would be a little bit more organized and detailed than just a, a post on X like this. All right. And we should point out again, uh, just to kind of reiterate here, uh, Gary Gensler also posting on X, and this is on his personal account or the account that's under his name at Gary Gensler, uh, saying that the SEC Gov Twitter account was compromised and an unauthorized tweet was posted. It says that SEC has not approved the listing and trading of spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. Shanali Bassick still with us here in our New York studios. Uh, we're also in conversation with Keely Lines and Eric Balchunas. Uh, Shanali, uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of speculation as to what happened, uh, what didn't happen. At the end of the day, they still have to make a decision, or at least the anticipation is they have to make that decision. Do you think we're going to see anything materially different maybe in 24 hours time than what we saw just over the last 20 minutes? And I had the same thought. The fact that there was this kind of a mistake until we know where the mistake came from, can the SEC then move forward and say, OK, we can rightfully still approve this in that deadline? They could always punt, right? They could always push it as they have before. They could also deny application. They could ask for more information. As we've seen uh, last minute amendments to the filings just this morning. Now, the idea of the market here, and you saw the reaction in pricing of Bitcoin, was that those amendments, those quick movements, were the SEC trying to move forward and get this page uh, cleared and, and get past this moment so that, you know, we can get these things approved with certainty now that there are so many issuers. But does this change the equation? We don't even really know how this compromise, yeah. as Gary Gensler called it. Remember, think about just yeah. the influence that X, or previously Twitter, yeah. has had on financial markets alone in the last several years, yeah. and the fights that the SEC has had over <laughs> this type of, uh, yeah. these type of issues and disclosures. Was it a breach? Was it not a breach? Right? I mean, they need to at least provide some clarity. Well, they, they need to provide clarity. I mean, 100%. I mean, you can't, I mean, if you believe the idea that approving these things somehow provides greater oversight, greater transparency, and this is the rollout, whether it was intentional, whether it was yeah. some fat finger thing or whatever, uh, it's not a good look one way no, or the other. No, someone's trolling it's not, the It's SEC. not a good look for SEC. It's certainly not a good look for X. I don't know why anybody's Yeah. There. Is it a good look for yeah. the crypto industry? I'm not yeah. sure either. Um, Eric Balchunas, as you move forward with planning ahead for your coverage tomorrow on uh, the Bitcoin ETFs, what would issuers have to say about this? How would they respond to the this messy rollout that we're seeing this afternoon? Uh, I, I, I don't think they like it. You know, I think, you know, we're, everybody's ready to pop champagne corks. Remember, this has been 10 years in the making. So I quote tweeted it and said, boom. I mean, I thought this was finally over. Um, I thought they were just giving us a little present, announcing it a day early. Again, I was expecting all of this to happen 4 to 5 p.m. tomorrow. So my guess is the industry, uh, if you've been in this for the last six months, this has happened. Coin Telegraph did something recently, uh, like two, a month ago, saying iShares was approved. That caused the problem. And then some guy recently, who mm -hmm. uh, a researcher said it wasn't getting approved. That caused the price to go down. We're kind of like you know road tough at this point. I, I don't you know I'm used to it, I guess, and I think the issuers are. Mm -hmm. But I think more they just want to get these things on the market, yeah. get them trading. They spend a lot of money on lawyers. They're ready to go. Let's do this. Uh, the SEC also put in thousands of man hours helping these issuers get. 200 page documents into playing shape over the last month. So um, unfortunate, whatever the reason, but I still yeah. see this happening uh, over the next uh, 48 hours. I, I do want to get your thoughts, Eric, uh, on a conversation that we had just prior to this. We were speaking with Dennis Kelleher, uh, the co-founder of Better Markets, who was opposed to the approval uh, of these exchange traded products. And he was kind of making the case here that, uh, at least for the retail investors, there's still an element of risk and fraud that, at least in his mind, is just way too outsized for this thing to really be out there here. And I am curious as to not only your own personal thoughts, but of the folks that you talk to in the industry, how they plan 
plan to address uh, that ri that risk and that fear? Yeah, I think the idea that it's new and it's exciting and a little risky is sort of part of what makes it so interesting as an investment. These most people, like normal people, are not buying this as 100% of the portfolio. They're going to put a little little of this on their portfolio, like like hot sauce or a speculation. They don't want to miss out in case this does become like a legit currency or goes up three or fourfold from here. So my take on to Dennis Kelleher and that Better Markets is what they don't address is that you can already get exposure in a multitude of ways that are way more flawed than an ETF or expensive, whether it's a crypto exchange, right, which is unregulated, or whether it's microstrategy stock or GBTC, which is an ETF. ETFs are have famous for giving investors the fairest shake at a good deal. And so that's really something they don't address. He just thinks it should be outlawed totally, which is a different debate. But as an investment, look, I mean, there's micro cap stocks that you could add to your portfolio that have just as much sizzle or risk as, as a, a crypto investment, in my opinion. And I just think, you know, there, it's okay to speculate. Like, not everything needs to be banned. Investors should have a little freedom to choose what they want. This is what Hester Peirce and some of the other commissioners uh, believe. You just have to disclose all the risks. And these documents that are part of these Bitcoin ETFs, the disclosure pages are like dozens of pages of risk disclosure. So I, yeah. I think they've done a good job of letting people know. All right. I appreciate uh, all you guys uh, jumping in on this. Going to have to say goodbye. Eric Balchunas, of course, uh, Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, co-host of ETF IQ. Our thanks to Keeley Lines down in Washington, who also hosts uh, Balance of Power, which comes on immediately after this program. And our very own Shanali Basak here in New York covers everything Wall Street uh, for us. And we should know, and thank you to Keeley for pointing this out, the tweet that the SEC uh, handle had tweeted out has finally been taken down. That post no longer exists on X. So uh, what the SEC was saying was that it was sent out by accident or it was compromised, um, that, that posting no longer exists. All right. I guess the moral of the story here is, I guess, wait for the official uh, filing coming out of the SEC and not necessarily the posts on social media. A lot that has to be sorted out by the folks over at X, by the folks at the SEC. Can stick with us. We'll have full coverage of all that as soon as it happens. When we come back after the break, we do want to go back out to Las Vegas, where that CES conference is taking place. A big focus this year on AI, a big focus on chips. And who better to talk to than the CEO of ARM, Renee Haas, is on deck. This is Bloomberg. Another wild day for crypto and not necessarily in the way that I think some folks wanted to see a tweet uh, on the platform X. Uh, which suggested that the SEC had actually approved the spot Bitcoin ETF. We learned from the SEC that that tweet uh, was not authorized by the SEC, and they have now corrected that, saying they have not made a decision just yet. Yeah, it was compromised. The Twitter account was compromised, so we'll continue to wait. All right, let's go on out to Las Vegas at the CES conference, where our very, Ed, very own Ed Ludlow is standing by with the CEO of ARM. Welcome to our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide. We are live at CES Las Vegas and we're joined by an executive that leads a company whose technology frankly touches every single display almost that is behind us at this 2.5 million net square foot exhibition, Rene Haas Arm CEO. Look, I, I still have some difficulty in explaining to people what ARM does with respect. And this is an interesting example, because if you take many of the TV displays that are on display here, other consumer electronics, ARM has helped design the semiconductors that are inside them. Is that accurate? I think so. If you think about um, all these devices becoming smart devices, whether it's a smart Roomba, smart washer and dryer, smart TV, they all need a brain inside that helps them learn what to do. That brain inside is ARM. So we were just chatting earlier about, well, where is ARM inside the show floor? Those four examples I just gave you, a couple, a washer, a dryer, a digital television, and a, and a Roomba, I can assure you, each one of those devices, is, ARM is the brain that makes those go. The common connection between everything here is AI. Uh, whether you're an automotive company, consumer electronics, even a, a beauty and healthcare company, ARM wants to be a part of the AI story. So let's start with that. You know, the story of 2023 was the H100, a GPU that goes into a server design, the server design goes into a data center. 
Arm's not quite fully in that market yet, but it wants to be. So give us a scorecard and where your progress has been. I think you have to step back and say, well, what is AI and, and where is AI going? AI has been with us today already to some level. For example, Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Ring Camera, Nest Camera, things that do facial recognition, for example, in those cameras, that's AI and that's running on ARM today. So to some level, we've already been there. Now, what's happened with ChatGPT and these large language models has been this next level step up of really a, a level of learning and uh, AI we've not seen before. So a lot of that work today is taking place in the cloud with training, and you mentioned H100. NVIDIA's next generation device, the GH200, uh, is Grace Hopper. Which Grace is the CPU, all ARM-based. Hopper is the GPU. So even in the most advanced training workloads, you're seeing ARM being used. On device. Cristiano Amon of Qualcomm was here earlier in that seat, wanting to talk about on device. What benefit does ARM feel from uh, a, a consumer that's willing to buy a smartphone in particular, where they can locally run a large language model or a generative AI tool powered by it? I think it's still early days in terms of what are the applications that are going to be really killer for the smartphones. The hardware is, is enabled now, so you have capability now inside the smartphone that can run these AI algorithms. But for example, two areas that people really care about are uh, latency and privacy. So if you're running some chat GPT or a personal assistant such as Pi by a company called Inflection AI, every query that you enter on your smartphone goes up into the cloud. So people who care a lot about security of their data are going to want to have those AI algorithms running locally. And not the least of which, they'll run faster because they're running inside your hand. We're trying to assess what the smartphone market is going to look like in 2024. It's still the mainstay of your yep. business. But it goes to a sort of functionality level. What do you think it is that we can put into a smartphone or enable a smartphone to do that drives an upgrade cycle and brings consumer enthusiasm. I think one thing that we've seen in this last cycle, which I think hopefully we're on the bottom of and it's now we're starting to come out of it, is that the premium smartphones, the most expensive smartphones, have actually done very, very well. And that's because people are trying to future-proof technology and, and their purchases to make sure they last a long time for the upgrade. As I said, it's still early days on what are these devices really going to do in terms of running the applications, but I think security and I think latency and power efficiency when you're running those algorithms are very key. Those are three areas that ARM is really good at. For our Bloomberg television and radio audience worldwide, we're sat here with ARM CEO Rene Haas at CES. To some, in some sense, it's like speed dating being here, right? All of your customers and partners are, are here in one place. What is it that they're wanting to talk to you about right now while they've got the time with you? Yeah, 150,000 plus. I'm not sure what the exact number is. It's a, it's a huge, huge audience. Uh, ARM is a unique player, you know, Ed, in that we are in so many different ecosystems. We're in the PC ecosystem, the automotive ecosystem, digital TV ecosystem, semiconductor ecosystem. It's one place where everyone comes and goes, and it's a great meeting to essentially align with what are the targets for the year, what do we see happening. Now, I was mentioning to a colleague earlier, we spend a lot of time, candidly, worrying about what's going to be at CES 2026, okay. CES 2027, and we're having those discussions now with partners about what are those enabling technologies. So believe it or not, you'd be surprised, most of these meetings are not about what's going to come out in six months, but about what's going to come out in three or four years. One thing that has surprised me about ARM is my old stomping ground, the automotive sector. Um, you are deeper in that than I think perhaps people realize. How is that business going and where do you, does ARM touch the, the, the automotive sector? So the way to think of an automobile now is essentially a, a high class computer, whether it's the digital cockpit or anything around automated driving. All of that requires an incredibly high software load. It requires a broad ecosystem. Again, all things that ARM is very, very good at. So when you look around the show floor here and you see chips from NVIDIA or chips from Qualcomm or chips from MediaTek or NXP or Renesas, all in the Mercedes and Audis and BMWs, all of that runs on ARM. I will assure you, every single vehicle on the show floor here at this show has ARM inside. So you win in any event? One way to look at it, but we've done a lot of work over the years relative to the software ecosystem, I think, to really put us in a place where fundamentally it's the right choice for consumers and uh, designers. I want to go back to to the next goal, which is that higher value server market. Do you see a road where you have a clear picture of the percentage of that market that you can touch compared to where you are now? 
You know, we've been at this for a long time. We started the server effort, believe it or not, in 2010. And, and now here in 2023, we're really starting to see significant market share. We're now in double digits. And for me, double digit market share starts to mean you've made a, a meaningful footprint. AWS, one of our great partners, announced Graviton 4, fourth generation of ARM. Microsoft just announced their own chip called Cobalt. We have a lot of other great announcements coming up with other, other hyperscalers. And one of our partners, Ampere, of course, has chips with ARM. And of course, I've mentioned them again, thank you NVIDIA, Grace Hopper, the most advanced training chip on the planet, uses ARM. In your most recent earnings, some investors, I think, were a little confused about what's happening right now in the current period and what you said would happen for the course of the year. What, what do you think it is that those investors misunderstood? You know, we're in a quiet period, so there's not much I can really say about uh, where we are in the earnings standpoint. But as I said, mo most of my focus, uh, Ed, is on three or four years from now, and I'm incredibly bullish about where ARM is going. I think you just have to look at the show floor again and then layer AI on top of it, and you see where ARM has an amazing opportunity going forward. So I'm really excited about our future. Rene Haas, ARM CEO's lawyer lurking in the background during this quiet period. Back to you guys in New York. All right, our thanks there to Ed with the CEO of ARM, Renee Haas, as we uh, round out our coverage here on The Close. Stick with us, because after the break, we're going to set you up for the big market movement events over the next 24 hours. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. This is the part of the show where we set you up for the big market moving events over the next 24 hours, what people will have their eyes on. And <laughs> guess what, Scarlett? I think they're going to have their eyes on tomorrow, the same thing they had their eyes on today, and that's approval of a Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, I feel like we front ran that a yeah. little bit today, right? Okay, so the news here is when the SEC will give an announcement on whether it approves those Bitcoin mm -hmm. ETF yep. filings. We thought we got it today, but it turned out to be a fake post. Uh, a fake post here, but we should point out, of course, they do have a court-mandated deadline, of course, to address this issue tomorrow. So. Hopefully, we'll get a decision. We're going to have a, a great lineup of interviews here uh, when, if and when that decision does come to talk a little bit more about of it. Of course. Kathy Wood will be on at 1 p.m. on a special edition of ETF IQ. And, of course, her filing is right in front of the SEC right now. We'll also be speaking with Hester Pierce, an SEC commissioner, as well. And we're going to go back out uh, to Las Vegas. There's a lot going on at CES. Maybe not the big uh, sort of flourishing product announcements that we had of old, but still some uh, important people are going to be there. We had Renee Haas on just a little bit earlier. Yeah, AIPCs is a big theme uh, for this current CES, but we'll be speaking with the Mountain CEO of, and also the CEO of NASDAQ and Qualcomm to get their takes. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they have to say and why exactly they're at CES. Ooh, yes. A little <laughs> mystery there. And, uh, of course, if you care about uh, the bond market, we got a big 10-year auction. Remember, the last couple of auctions actually went relatively well. The 10-year, of course, that's the benchmark. Right, and it's been stuck around that 4% level, so mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow's auction will move that a little bit, but 4% has proven to be a very, very sustainable uh, source of support. And we should point out this auction, of course, coming against the backdrop of the latest inflation data that we're going to get this week. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with more coverage on the close. Meanwhile, a balance of power is coming up next uh, down out of Washington, so stick around. I'm sure you're going to have more on what the heck is going on over at the SEC and Bitcoin.